Good evening, and welcome to the March 7th, 2024 meeting of the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission. Could we start with a roll call, please? Commissioner, Commissioner Dan? Here. Gordon? Here. Kennedy? Here. McKelvey? Here. Paul Hamas? Here. Thompson? Conway? Uh, Commissioner Thompson? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Sorry, I'm, I'm here. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and I'm here as well. Thank you very much. Um, and we'll start. Do we have any statements of disqualification this evening? Seeing none, we will move on to oral communications. This is the part of the agenda in which uh, the public is welcome to address the commission on items that are not on tonight's agenda, but that, are, that do fall under the purview of the Planning Commission. Are we having some funny sound? Something's going on with the sound, it sounds like. I want to make sure that it's that. Uh, Can you all hear? If there's a TV problem, I'm sure they'll come and let us know because it seems like the mic is cutting in and out. Okay, so we will start with um, a motion to approve the minutes of February 15th, 2024. So moved. And is there a second? I'll second. And. Uh, Everyone who approves, please indicate by saying aye. 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 And then I'm sure you're about to do this, but we should do oral communications too. Oh, I had started that when the mic went crazy. Thank you. Sorry about that. And I still need, um, did, is, is anyone voting against the motion for minutes? Okay, we're jumping around tonight. Um, so again, to return to oral communication, you are invited to address the commission on, we're not gonna have a meeting with disturbances or disrespect for the public agenda. Oh, I, okay, thank you for telling me that. You know what, the, um, I just, uh, thank you very much. Very welcome to participate and listen to the meeting. I appreciate that. If anybody would like to address the commission on anything not on tonight's agenda, please come forward now. <laughs> Seeing none, we will move on to the matter for tonight. Um, on tonight's agenda is consideration of a project proposed at 1129 Mission Street, project number CP23. Dash zero one zero zero six administrative use permit to establish a cannabis retail facility on a parcel in the mixed use medium density zone district and within the Mission Street urban design plan. Could we have a staff report, please? Uh, good evening, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, Ryan Bain, Senior Planner. So, um, yes, the proposal we have before us tonight. Uh, is a, a cannabis retail outlet within an existing commercial uh, building, building located on the uh, northeast corner of Mission Street and Laurel Street uh, in the MUM Zone District. Uh, the building was occupied by Emily's Bakery for many years, and the 2,878 square foot building is being proposed to be split into two commercial spaces, um, including 1,000 square feet for uh, Emily's Kitchen and Cafe, and 1,878 square feet for a new cannabis retail store uh, by the name of The Hook Santa Cruz. So the zoning ordinance Excuse allowed. me, um, are we supposed to be seeing a staff report? Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. I didn't look up and assumed it was visible. Um, let me go back just a second. <laughs> it's that kind of night. Well, hold on. Is that in this 
Well, having technical difficulties, I'm sorry. Let me go ahead and I'll just speak and then when I catch up to the slide, I will. Okay. So um, as I was saying, the zoning ordinance allows cannabis retail sales in the MEM zone district with approval and administrative use permit and subject to um, our cannabis regulations, which is section 2412 of the, the municipal code. The zoning code allows cannabis retail sales with approval of a administrative use permit, a city cannabis retailer license, and the obtaining of a state cannabis retailer or nonprofit license. So the applicant recently uh, applied for a transfer of one of the five cannabis retail licenses that are available within the city. Um, that license transfer has been approved by the city with final administrative steps being completed to transfer the license from WAM, Vital Therapies, to the current applicant. Um, WAM has been a, a longtime local dispensary that has been committed to compassionate care, uh, dedicated to both accessible and affordable cannabis for individuals with serious illnesses. Um, the Hook will have a, a partnership with WAM to ensure that the affordable cannabis reaches community members in, in dire need. And the collaboration with WAM will ensure, will ensure that the segment of the sales goes toward providing free or, or sliding scale cannabis to low income patients suffering from severe medical conditions like cancer, AIDS, MS, and, and epilepsy. So um, the subject parcel has a mixed use, medium density, general plan designation. Um, this designation is intended to accommodate businesses that serve the general needs of the community, including retail, um, such as what is being proposed, um, service and office establishments, uh, grocery stores and furniture and those type of uses. Um, let's see. So the cannabis industry in Santa Cruz as a whole, um, which is not just retail, but manufacturing, distribution, there's labs, um, many cannabis uses within the city of Santa Cruz. And it benefits the public um, by providing additional high quality jobs within the city, including scientists and other technical positions. Um, the Hook would be one of two cannabis retail stores that serves the west side neighborhoods as well as visitors to the city. Um, the land use element and the economic development element of the general plan lists goals and policies that support the proposed use at this location. Um, I listed several in the staff report and I just pulled a few um, here just um, for the presentation. Um, fostering and retaining a locally owned business and startup, um, pursuing the expansion of employment intensive uses that have long term economic viability and, and so on. Um, that said, um, the general plan's guiding principles express the city's commitment to educational to education through our schools, educational systems and programs. So the Santa Cruz City School District school district has expressed concerns about the proposed business uh, due to its proximity um, to routes to and from Santa Cruz High School and Mission Middle School. Uh, opponents to the proposed use indicate that the, the normalization of cannabis use due to repeated exposure to business patrons and signage or the easy access to the dispensary could result in increased use of cannabis among students and such use would have implications on children's health and development. So while the proposed use is consistent with a number of the general, pol general plan policies that I previously discussed, um, the project opponents would suggest that the general plan um, inconsistencies um, could be exposed with these three policies regarding juvenile behavior and delinquency, um, the Santa Cruz City Schools and private schools to provide drug prevention, and, and implementing safe routes to schools. The uh, subject parcel is also located in the Mission Street Urban Design Plan. Um, the project, uh, the vision of the plan is to reestablish Mission Street as a vibrant commercial corridor that recognizes and carefully balances its functions as both a state highway and local serving commercial street um, to enhance economic and social vitality of the Mission Street corridor uh, by creating a mix of uses that serve both community and visitor needs. And, establish the Mission Street Quarter as an attractive pedestrian-oriented district and encourage local serving commercial uses um, to reduce automobile use. So the project accomplishes these goals. 
In regards to uh, some of the details of the actual use itself, um, the proposed retail use would be conducted entirely within the, the existing commercial building. Uh, the proposed hours are from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, it should be noted that our cannabis ordinance allows um, them to operate between 7 and 10. And so, but they are limiting it from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. currently. Um, the Hook Santa Cruz would employ up to 10 uh, individuals on site and anticipates up to three commercial deliveries entering and exiting the site per day, uh, mainly between 8 th 8.30 to 3, Monday through Friday. Um, the business would provide labeled pro uh, packaged products, sell them directly to consumers, both the medical and adult use markets, and no cannabis products would be visible from the exterior of the store, and customers would leave the building with products in opaque packaging. These are all standard requirements of all of our retail um, businesses and, and are part of the performance standards in our ordinance. Um, the applicant is proposing a secure facility as provided a detailed security plan uh, that meets the requirements of the state of California and the city of Santa Cruz uh, regulations. The plan includes a perimeter security lighting and video surveillance. Uh, these measures include installing um, physical barriers such as security gates, high security steel exterior doors, um, integrated camera and alarm system would be installed, uh, as well as exterior cameras equipped with license plate readers. Um, and the Santa Cruz Police Department has reviewed and accepted the security plan. As I mentioned, there are performance standards in our cannabis ordinance um, uh, that are required for, for all cannabis uses. Um, the standards regulate criteria such as security, noise, um, odor, um, no product usage on site, hours of operation, uh, loitering, little removal, and advertising. So the proposed use has been reviewed and is consistent with all of the performance standards uh, laid out in our ordinance. So in regards to siting criteria, um, our ordinance requires that cannabis retail sales facilities maintain a 600-foot buffer from schools, um, parks, daycare centers, and youth centers, as well as other uh, cannabis retail outlets. Um, the proposed project meets all of these specified setback requirements, uh, including maintaining a distance of approximately 850 feet from Santa Cruz High and 1,360 feet from Mission Hill uh, Middle School. So while there is a, a fairly long history of cannabis ordinances here in Santa Cruz, the current ordinance was adopted uh, following state legalization of cannabis in 2017. Um, the establishment of the ordinance included input from various departments, including obviously the police department, economic development, city manager's office, city attorney's office, as well as went through several um, numerous hearings before the planning commission. Uh, and the city council and, and gathered uh, input at, at those public hearings. So um, state law required a 600 foot buffer and at the time as they were going through this process the police department suggested that the recreational marijuana retail businesses be treated similar to our tobacco businesses which require a 600 foot buffer from high risk alcohol outlets such as liquor stores and bars. Um, so in November of 2017 after several public hearings and discussions uh, the City Council adopted the new ordinance establishing the 600-foot buffer and limited the number of retail establishments to five. Um, so the map that's before you indicates the locations within the city that uh, meet the locational restrictions. Um, as you can see, the, the green areas are um, the areas outside of the buffer zones that would allow retail. And it's, it's fairly limited, as you can see, based on the map. So the zoning code establishes findings um, to be determined by the appropriate hearing body in order to approve an administrative use permit for a cannabis, cannabis use. Um, upon the review of these findings, staff found that they, they can be made based on the information provided by the applicant and, proposed, and the proposed retail use meeting the required zoning code requirements as we previously discussed. Um, concerns have been expressed by the school district and opponents over the location of the proposed use and its proximity to Santa Cruz High School and Mission Middle School, um, raising the question as to whether the application 
meets the intent of finding number two, which I have listed here regarding the cannabis retail use being located within proximity of an incompatible use, such as a children's school, daycare facility, or youth center. Um, while the use meets the objective standard of 600 feet um, from schools and daycares and youth centers, the question arises as to whether the cannabis retail, retail use could be considered, quote, within proximity and, quote, adversely affect the health and safety or welfare uh, of proximate uses, namely students uh, of the high school and the middle school. Um, a similar argument could be made for finding, finding, um, for finding four, which speaks to the use being compatible with other neighboring uses in the surrounding area, particularly those used primarily by persons under the age of 18. Um, these findings are, are more subjective, obviously, than the strict 600-foot uh, separation requirement, hence the administrative use permit being a, a discretionary uh, decision by hearing body. Um, the Santa Cruz Police Department has reviewed both the cannabis retail license transfer as well as the, the subject administrative use permit application. Um, with the project outside of the buffer zone and the stringent ID requirements um, for adults 21 years old and older, um, the police department did not express any concerns with the proposed location. Uh, additionally, as part of the review of this application, um, police researched their records for other cannabis retail outlets in the city and found no complaints or service calls for cannabis sales to minors. Um, based on these facts, it could be argued that the proposed retail use does not qualify as within proximity of a school and that it would not adversely affect the health or safety of students. Um, it could also be argued that uh, it could be unfair to the applicant to, quote, move, kind of move the goalpost, so to speak, um, claiming um, the established 600 buffer to be insufficient. So just some food, food for thought. Um, many concerns about the proposed use at this location have been expressed by the school district and parents of the Santa Cruz High and Mission Hill Middle School students, and those concerns are, are certainly understandable. Um, a number of students from both schools walk and bike um, by this location each day, um, with a signalized intersection of Laurel and Mission Street serving as one of the two primary locations uh, where students cross Mission Street and the presence of a dispensary could be conveyed as, as normalizing cannabis use. So, I should say, also, uh, it's not uncom uncommon for underage individuals to obtain fake IDs or, or medicinal uh, cannabis cards. So, in addition to providing a letter of opposition, um, the superintendent of schools has also included a number of articles on the impact of THC on the youth, the impact of dispensaries to schools, um, the acquiring of fake IDs and relevant school data on marijuana use uh, within the school district. And that's all been provided um, as part of the staff report. Um, to add to the discussion, um, the applicant has also provided data um, regarding the effects of marijuana on young people and the effectiveness of, of ID policies at cannabis outlets, assessing the ease of access to marijuana by underage patrons. Um, while the general population um, must be 21 years or older to purchase recreational cannabis. Adults 18 years and older have a doc who have a doctor's prescription for medical cannabis um, can also legally purchase cannabis at retail stores. Um, anecdotes have pointed to ease of obtaining a medical cannabis card, which have raised concerns about 18-year-old high school students having legal access to cannabis products, which they then could distribute to others. Um, to combat this concern, the applicant has voluntarily agreed to sell cannabis, to not sell cannabis to anyone under the age of 19, um, even if they have a valid medical cannabis prescription. And that's been included as a condition of approval um, with, the, uh, with the resolution for approval, if you decide to go that route. So, in conclusion, um, the proposed cannabis retail use meets all of the objective standards um, laid out in the city zoning code. That being said, um, subjective findings raise some questions as to the potential impacts um, the use could have on high school and middle school students, given the proximity to the high school and the site's location at the key Mission Street crossing. Um, there are certainly merits to both arguments, and, and both sides present valid points. 
Um, hence, staff recommends that the Planning Commission consider the information provided and, and make a determination to approve or deny the application based on one of, one of the resolutions provided with the staff report. Um, I'm available for any questions. Also, I'll mention that the, the applicant as well as the uh, superintendent of schools both have presentations. Oh. Okay, thank you. Um, this is usually the point in time where the commission asks questions of staff. And um, are there any questions at this time? Commissioner McKelvey. Thanks for the presentation, and thank you for everyone for being. Thank you to everyone for being here. Um, so, just a question about the bakery proposal, or it's called a bakery in the in the report, but it's being described differently a little bit uh, in your in your summary. Is that something that's already proposed or something that, because it's an existing use, it's simply assumed that it will be that down the road? Is it is it the same? Will it be the same people running it? Is there, a, is there any more information on that at this point? The applicant might be able to provide that information when they come up Maybe to their presentation. Maybe that's part of the presentation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but... Um, my understanding is that, yeah, they're basically breaking that part out, and there is still going to remain that 1,000 square feet, I think. Yeah. That'll be a bakery use, uh, just which is, a, I think it's a principally permitted use. I don't it think. is, yeah. yeah. And it's and it's so. an existing use. I'm just wondering right. if, if there could be more information provided about that. Um, I'd be curious about, there was a slide before the SP, S, SCPD comments. I don't know if you can go back to it, but it mentioned. I was having a hard time going back <laughs> I'm reason. sorry. We I can't even get out of it tonight. for some reason. So I'm not sure what. You know, the more people show up, Here we go. the worse the technology does. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> What's funny is we came in like, you know, an hour ahead of time and, of course, tested everything. It was fine. So, uh, of course, when we I go actually do the presentation, it was getting stuck on me. So, um, so I'm sorry. This right before you referring this, to? Right before the slide, I think, that said SCPD uh, meetings or input or something like that. Okay. Was before was the, the findings? Yeah. Okay. So um, I can put it back on the slideshow. Okay, so I'll, it says I'll leave in it number. For now. Sorry. I'll leave it for now. So. Okay. So number four, it says the proposed use is compatible with the sizes and types of other neighboring uses in the surrounding area, particularly those used primarily by persons under the age of eighteen. So can you tell me about how that's? How you assess that? It, given that we're talking about it should be only 19 and above, uh, according to the proposal, was there uh, is there something? You, it's more information you can give us about that. Back to it. So the, I mean, so is your question regarding our so, interpretation of the yeah, it of says the finding or mm -hmm. it okay. says it's compatible, but then it goes on to say, particularly those used primarily by persons under the age of 18 and. Maybe this is a, I'm missing the point completely, but I'm I'm wondering, given that we're saying that the conditions state explicitly that this is 19, for 19 and over, what is the compatibility criteria you're describing there? I mean, they're kind of two different. I mean, this is this is what was adopted mm -hmm. by the city council in 2017 as a as a finding mm -hmm. um, for cannabis use. Um, and so basically that this is one of those discretionary subjective findings that you as a as the commission need to discuss whether you think that the proposal is one within what would what was called out as within proximity right mm -hmm. two whether it's compatible with so it's a it's a with the school I mean, it's, I mean really it's the two schools that are the primary that are the uses that of you know mm -hmm. with that have people under the age of eighteen, right? So if you think that's going to be a negative impact, so, yeah, that's the, okay. That. So it's the question, and then and then in terms of the nineteen, I mean that's the the, the volunteer. That's basically a condition that the applicant has volunteered, yeah. um, based on what he's heard and the concerns he's heard from the school district, from parents, um, to not sell to anyone under the age of, okay. of nineteen. Um, and then the last thing was um, talked about, you know, stringent or more stringent screening of identification, et cetera. I think that might have been part of the SCPD comments, but um, either, I don't know, perhaps it's something that the, 
the uh, applicant provide, could provide, or if you have more information about that, I'd appreciate hearing that as well. I mean, I think what we were just referring to is that, you know, state law and city requirements in terms of security and those, those requirements in terms of providing ID, security guard at the door to check IDs, all those type of things. And, and so it's, it's not necessarily more, it just meets the criteria that we laid out. Just meeting the criteria, out. correct, yeah. Okay. Nothing, nothing more. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Any other sure. commissioners? Uh, yes, Commissioner Dan. Um, I actually, I was going to reserve my comments um, for after public hearing, but yeah. because you were asking a question about finding number four, I believe I remember the intent behind cre the creation of that finding, and I believe that it was um, to address um, other uses that might be incompatible, like, I don't know, like a, a kid's gym or a candy store or something that wasn't covered by the school, daycare, park, just to cover base. Sorry. I guess that's the end of my comment. <laughs> we do have a tech gremlin tonight, so thank you for your patience, everyone. <laughs> Were there other questions? This is the time for questions of staff from commissioners. Yes, Commissioner Polhamus. Thank you to the chair. Um, it was, I do have questions for staff. It was suggested that uh, I make a quick statement just while I am a Santa Cruz City Schools employee. I read the agenda packet, including the project plans, the articles of a scientific nature about cannabis use, and also the public correspondence, and I'll be making a determination based on that evidence. So just so everything's above board and everybody knows where I stand on this or where, you know, where I work. Um, so, yeah. Uh, a couple questions for staff. Um, on, I think it was the administrative use permit number four, um, same area that uh, Commissioner McKelvey was talking about. Let me pull up. Um, the proposed use is compatible with the sizes and types of other neighboring uses in the surrounding area, um, particularly those used primarily by persons under the age of 18. And then also number two, where it talks about incompatible uses near uh, Looks like particularly youth uses, but um, I'm just curious if there's anything in the administrative use permit that has anything to do with um, alcohol or drug drug rehab facilities, or anything of that nature. In the in the ordinance. In the or, yeah. No, I don't believe there's. Not anything. particularly. Okay. No. Okay. You mean a buffer between rehab facilities? I believe yeah, that so is. Yeah. So at, at the end of it. Weeks uh, Avenue, I I call it the one way. There is, as far as I know, a sober living environment. It may be a program. I'm not sure what goes on there, but um, I know that's it's related to that. I'm just curious if there's anything, any criteria in the ordinance or anything along those lines. Now, you, just to clarify, so you're asking me if there's anything in our, zone, our zoning ordinance regarding cannabis retail uses and a buffer from something outside of what's listed? Oh, is this exhaustive for the cannabis ordinance in terms of... Let's see here. I don't actually. I don't know that I have the actual ordinance in my presentation, but I can. I can look up and see what the exact wording is. But I don't believe there's anything that that specifies that. Okay. Mr. Butler, <coughs> I've got the ordinance open Thank right you. here, so I can. I can read it for you. It's uh, in. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Twenty-four dot twelve dot thirteen twenty. Um, use types and siting criteria. In um, subsection five, um, the second paragraph of subsection five, although it's, it's not numbered number two, it's just a, a separate paragraph. Cannabis retail sales facilities, including nonprofit and micro businesses, shall not be located within 600 feet as measured from the property lines from any school providing instruction in kindergarten or any grades one through 12, daycare center or youth center as defined in the state of California Health and Safety Code section 11353.1. That is in existence at the time the state license for the facility is issued. In addition, no retail sales facility, including a business holding a nonprofit state, uh, nonprofit or state micro business license, shall be located within 600 feet from an existing cannabis retail sales facility. So there are the schools, the daycare centers, the youth centers, and uh, the other cannabis retail sales facilities. And I'll, I'll note the map just um, so that members of the public are aware. This was in your staff report, so, you know, but um, the map that was shown does not include the locations of other 
um, cannabis retailers. It's just the buffers between the schools, childcare, youth centers, and parks with play structures. Thank you. Okay, great. Oh, well, thank you. Okay. Any other questions from commissioners of staff? Yeah, one. Commissioner Kennedy. I think, uh, yeah, my question was like, do the buffers update as like uses come and go? And Lee kind of answered it by saying like, what's in place the when the, uh, the facility opens? So that's not a question anymore. Uh, my other one is, well, along with that, do you remember like alcohol, tobacco? Do they have similar buffers in those ordinances? Yeah, I kind of. I mean, my memory is it's pretty much the same. I kind of reference that. Feet? Yeah. So I think when they were considering the cannabis uh, adoption of the of the latest cannabis ordinance in 2017, that was one of the thing that one of the things that the police department referenced was you know, consistency with the tobacco section. And okay. So that that's a 600 hundred foot buffer as well, is my understanding. It's a different question because we had a lot of those to start with. Where is this a new use? But um, okay. Um, so then my last question was, like, the tax on cannabis like provides a good amount of revenue, and I know that's been distributed to fairly cool things. But do you know? Like, can you describe that more? And I'm sorry if you don't know. It's not really your scope, but yeah, unfortunately, I don't. I don't. Get too involved it's in, kind that, of a in those aspects of taxing. Sure. So um, there are varying uh, taxation levels for different types of cannabis. Um, the commission may recall that um, a few years ago there was a vote uh, for a children's fund that um, uh, dedicates a percentage of the cannabis tax revenue to um, various. Uh, Nonprofits uh, that um, provide uh, services uh, for children in the community. Um, right now, um, I believe that that uh, call for um, services is actually open, and um, I don't have the specific number, but it's around eight hundred thousand dollars that we have in that fund um, for various youth um, programs in the community. So. Um, folks that are um, operating nonprofits, it's a little mm -hmm, plug mm -hmm. to take a look at that right now because there is money available from the, the city. All right, thanks. That's a bit beyond our purview, but I just was curious about it. So yep. thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Is that it? That's it. Okay. I have a couple of questions of staff also. Um, first of all, um, if the age limit um, first of all, my first question is, can the city impose an age limit of 21 instead of 19? Okay. Hi, I'm Cassie Bronson. I'm the assistant city attorney. Uh, happy to take this question. Uh, the city's municipal code is pretty broad in that there are certainly uh, a few provisions which would suggest that you can impose conditions intended to promote public health, safety, welfare, and to you know prevent nuisance type conditions um with that said you know i haven't seen a specific case law on this um and i'd be happy to consider anything that the applicant has uh, to consider this is the first time i'm considering the question um so that's that's basically my response is that the municipal, municipal code seems to suggest yes there may be some case law i'm unaware of i'd be happy to consider i will say the city even if the city raised the age limit um, in through these conditions, it wouldn't make it a crime for that person to purchase cannabis, right? So that's set by state law. It, that would just be a condition of the permit. And if that condition were violated, then they would have violated their permit condition and there would be, you know, administrative procedures that might come into play. Uh, but there would be no like criminal activity related to selling cannabis to somebody who was between the ages of 18 and 21. Okay, thank you for that and for taking that cold. I appreciate that. Um, and a second related question is, let's just say the age limit was 21 instead of 19. How far would uh, 18 to 21-year-old um, have to travel to legally acquire for medical use? So in other words, how far is the closest 
Um, and and so that's also a cold question, so. <laughs> so we currently have four dispensaries. Okay. Um, five, we're allowed five total. This is one of them, obviously. Um, I think the closest, I think the closest might be on the west side, like off of Swift or Fair okay. over there. Um, then there's, there's uh, I think it's a Cannon Cruise that's in Harvey West, right. um, which as the crow flies may be closer actually. Um, and then there's two dispensaries on Ocean Street, um, one being Reefside kind of near Marianne's right there, and then um, Kind Peoples. Right. So they're all, I think I looked at that a while ago, and I want to say they were all around a mile or so distant from this location. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Um, and finally, this is just a question on our process tonight. Um, is there a time constraint pushing on approval of this permit um, other than the usual a development's been in process for a long time? We don't have any other constraints. Um, okay, just wanted to know that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and with that, um, the applicant has a presentation. And um, could you tell us how long you expect to take? I actually uh, requested earlier that I go after Superintendent Monroe. So if you guys would allow that request, I'd greatly appreciate it. I don't have a problem with that. Um, in that case, um, could we ask Superintendent Monroe for her presentation? Okay. So while Ryan's getting my presentation out, I just, good evening. Um, thank you to the commissioners and city staff for all you do to serve our community. Um, tonight we just have um, a brief presentation to talk about the concerns that we've shared. Um, and I, I want to be clear that um, what we're asking for is a revisit on the ordinance and the distance that the city allows cannabis uh, dispensaries near school sites. Um, and um, I could have you Ryan advance that, please. I want to make it clear that um, we aren't against medical marijuana. We aren't against legal dispensaries. That's, that's not our intent. Um, I regret the impact that this would have on a business, you know, on a business owner. But I also believe it's our obligation as a community of adults to create safe, healthy environments for the children and youth in our community. And given all of the benefits that the marijuana industry and medical marijuana brings to our community, it can't obscure that. Those benefits should not obscure the impacts and the concerns and the health and safety concerns that it raises for, for children and youth that use cannabis and their developing brains. And I'm going to have, we have um, some professionals, parents, principals here today to sh share with you information about why we are concerned about the proximity to our two schools of this proposed, pres proposed business. So I want to, um, we can advance the slides. I'm going to invite um, Derek Kendall, principal at Mission Hill Middle School, and Michelle Poyer, principal at Santa Cruz High School. Hello, if you could advance the slide, please. Um, my name is Derek Kendall. I'm the principal at Mission Hill Middle School, and I'm here this evening with my friend and colleague, Michelle Poirier, who's the principal at Santa Cruz High School. Um, at both of our schools, um, we have the mission to create an environment where every student can excel academically, emotionally, and socially. Um, and with students vaping pot on the increase sevenfold in America, and vaping pot becoming much more potent, opening a dispensary within such a close proximity to our schools will only make our daily mission more challenging. The proposed location at Laurel and Mission is where students use the stoplight and crosswalk to safely access the north and south sides of Mission Street. 
Every school day, students use this safe crossing to walk to and from home, and they also frequent existing businesses at this intersection, such as the food bin, the taco truck, and Taqueria Vallarta. Nationally, students under the influence of marijuana has doubled in recent years, and more and more youth are developing cannabis use disorder. And while I recognize and respect that this particular business may not be directly responsible for those statistics, this business and this location increases the risk of our students becoming a part of this statistic. And to speak more to that, I want to invite my friend Michelle to the microphone. Thank you. I'm grateful for the time you have to um, allow us to speak to you um, around especially our mission of educating the youth of Santa Cruz to be prepared for college and career. And as um, my colleague, Mr. Kendall, um, mentioned, this increase in vaping, vaping is very difficult to detect, that our schools have had an increase in students under the influence that have doubled in a single year. And so we see that there's quite a bit of widespread use. And if you could advance the slide. Thank you. So student focus groups were conducted at several sites, high school sites, and widespread um, statements by students that it's super easy to obtain a scannable fake ID. And high school students know this. My own students, my own two children, certainly would have attested to that. And medical cards are super easy to obtain as well. Um, so it's a constant battle for us on campus because, again, of the widespread use and the ease of access. And when we talk about the ideas of moving the bar from an 18 to a 19 to a 21, the fake IDs make that a negligible d distinction because I have 16 and 17 year olds on my campus who can certainly pass for 18, 19, or 21. I have 18 and 19 year olds on my campus. I have 18 and 19 year olds on my campus. And as uh, Mr. Kendall pointed out, that is a very, very heavily thoroughfare, uh, heavily populated thoroughfare for our students. A student can very quickly conduct sort of a business negotiation or quickly obtain and make it back to campus very quickly without it needing to become an alarm because they are late to their third period class. So I, we're, we're really about not, we're celebrating marijuana as an economic boon and for what it does to the community. Uh, my own cousin died of brain cancer. Um, I, I am sensitive and to that use, but what we're talking about is eliminating or, or minimizing the exposure that students have to this because it is very deleterious to students learning when their brains are altered by a high level of THC. Thank you. And I'm going to um, bring in a medical personnel. Next slide, please. Hi. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Sarah Moff. I'm a pediatrician and a medical director in our community. So Welcome. appreciate you having me here. Um, I wanted to talk today about um, like the why behind what we're talking about today. So why do we care? So um, we know that marijuana can have effects on um, the, the developing brain that can affect cognitive and memory damage, serious mental illness like depression, psychosis, violence, and addiction to alcohol and other drugs into adulthood. Um, as far as the uh, mental illness, the evidence in the NIH studies and Duoden studies um, showed that cannabis asso was associated with increased risk of early onset psychosis dis disorders, as well as suicidal and behavioral um, thoughts and behaviors in teenagers. Um, they also did a really um, intensive study that showed that kids who use cannabis at the age of 15 are four times more likely to develop schizophrenia. Um, the younger the age at the initiation of the cannabis use is associated with faster and more severe development of cannabis, cannabis use disorder. Um, there's also a couple of really good studies that um, talk about violence in youth that use cannabis, um, specifically two that I have stated here. Um, there was a youth risk behavior study that showed that um, that was done between 12 and 18 year olds um, who showed that youth that 
use marijuana are three times more likely to be aggressive um, compared to alcohol. <laughs> I know, and they actually hypothesized in the study that people thought that it was going to be less likely, but it actually showed that they actually are more likely to be aggressive, um, with alcohol being um, 2.7 times likely, to, more likely, and then the combination of both being six times more likely. And this game, Cambridge study that was a meta-analysis of 300,000 people showed that marijuana use at 18 years old is associated with a nine-fold increase in violent behaviors. So um, next slide, please. So this is the kind of why behind it. So the, here's the science behind it. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are aware of this, but basically the, the concept of is, the, um, it, is that marijuana acts on the endocannabinoid system. So the endocannabinoid system is a system in our brain that really kind of helps as our brains develop. It does things like synaptic pruning. It helps with development of our white matter. Um, it regulates many things in our bodies that are listed here, learning and memory, emotional processing, sleep, temperature control, pain, um, inflammation and immune responses and eating. Um, we think that cannabis is, the studies show that cannabis is more harmful during the adolescence period because th this is a developing part of our brain. And so the endocannabinoid system is really what's doing the kind of sending messages and pruning and making sure that things are um, being, uh, that the myelin sheaths on the nerves and stuff are being, are developing in the correct way. And when you interrupt that with exogenous um, THC or cannabis, um, you're actually uh, downplaying or upregulating these receptors and you're changing the way that the brain is developing. Um, next slide, please. So they've done a lot of studies on the what can we do to prevent youth using because of what I just spoke to. Um, so the, the things that have been really shown to be protective and really help youth decrease their use are pro-social opportunities such as community sports, youth programs, um, and also community norms that discourage youth use. Um, things that are shown to be risk factors for youth development of cannabis use are widespread variability of marijuana, greater marijuana outlet, outlet density, more days and hours of marijuana sales, exposure to marijuana marketing, youth following marijuana businesses on social media, and new marijuana products that attract youth. And next slide. That's it. So um, I have all the cita citations for the studies if you guys are interested. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Good evening, Kristen O'Connor. I'm a nurse and I work with families and adolescents in Santa Cruz County. And I just want to say the American Academy of Pediatrics strongly recommends that adolescents do not use marijuana until the brain is fully formed. And what we're seeing in our county with um, adolescents and youth is that they are using marijuana. And that is because the perception of risk and harm is not there. For and we know that from the Monitoring the Future studies. We've seen this in our county. And because of that, because of harms are not realize we have more and more adolescents that are trying it, even though drug use has actually gone down in our country, um, including with alcohol, hasn't done that with vaping or with marijuana. And what we are seeing in our clinic, specific health outcomes that we're treating are lung-related issues from um, students that we have that are vaping all day long, and they're um, getting access to this by people who are dropping off vape pens at the school, they're taking it into the bathroom, they're sharing it, they're passing it around on social media that this is there. And we are treating them in our clinic with lung and respiratory issues, school issues, we are having to provide family therapy. And it's an uphill battle for us as providers in this community. We're seeing families that are really torn apart by that. Um, I'd also like to say there's hyperemesis cannabis syndrome, which is paradoxical because a lot of times marijuana is very helpful for nausea, but it can cause very acute, violent nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. With We've treated adolescents and sent them to the urgent care in ER, and it's been a very upsetting experience. Um, and finally, I'd like to say that there is an increased risk of motor vehicle accident after you use marijuana, and youth do not perceive that risk. We may as adults. It's just a different set of marijuana that we're dealing with with our adolescent kids than it was when we were younger. We never had to send our um, friends and schoolmates to the ER with a psychosis, which we've had to do in our county. So signage around dispensaries has been shown to increase use for young adults, and that's our concern about having a dispensary close to two schools in our county. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other? Hi, uh, my name is Sage. I'm a licensed clinical therapist and I treat addiction and I work with associates, interns. I train them to do this work. Um, I, I want to repeat that I don't think any of us don't want to see this dispensary exist. It's just location, location, location. So. Um, I have a son at Santa Cruz High School, and he fills me in, too. And there is lots of legal 
weed in the school. There's lots of uh, cartridges. It's not hard for them to get. I have seen the sites for the fake IDs. It's all there. It's very easy for them. <clears throat> we have been treating kids for uh, depression and anxiety. It has gone through the roof. We People can't find therapists. I don't know if any of you have had this experience, but I'm fielding calls every day from parents desperate to find treatment, and they can't. Um, my counselors, we take Medi-Cal, and we are full, we are busy. And what we find is that the youth that are using, which, uh, you know, some of them are just partying. There's like a, there's two different groups. There's like the kids that are partying, but there are the kids that are using several times a day, every day. And what happens is they're medicating their anxiety, they're medicating their depression. That means we can't treat them. We can't treat depression if you're medicated for it, but you depend on that medication because that medication isn't actually treating the problem, it is hiding the problem. And when you're high, you can't have access to your emotional states, you can't have insight. So you're not, the treatment isn't effective. So it's really been a huge problem for us. So we operate in a harm reduction approach and we find this to be the most effective thing. We don't tell kids you have to stop. We don't tell them what to do. We say, what are you struggling with? We're struggling with, I have no friends left. I hide in my room and I smoke all day. I stopped going to school and I'm fighting with my parents. All of this is important information and it's about kids and weed. I wanna say as a parent that for me, putting this dispensary in this location, whether it's 600 or 700 square feet away from the school, it just makes no sense. People laughed before about normalizing, but that's exactly what's happening. And I think we're doing an experiment. We legalized weed and we're doing an experiment on our kids and we're finding the results. So normalizing is great because it is normal for adults, but is it normal for the 13 year old who became psychotic in my office? It's not, right? There's too much, it's too much, it's too close. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Were there other speakers for the school district? I'm Claudia Bestel. I'm a president of Santa Cruz City Schools Board. And I just want to start by saying that I, I uh, have no problem with marijuana use by um, either medical or recreational by adults. And no problem with the uh, Hook Outlet and their dispensaries in uh, Capitola and South County. Having one in such close proximity to Santa Cruz High School is a problem. As a board member, I take responsibility for providing a safe environment for our students very seriously. Our board passed a resolution last month that recognizes the dangers of marijuana for youth and identifies that a buffer around our schools would help support that safe environment. We would like to align with the uh, Monterey Public Risk Matrix which was developed by the uh, Public Health Institute to create that safe zone. We ask that city leaders also make decisions to prioritize the health and well-being of our youth. Thank you. So we want to thank you for your time. Um, and I just want to close with, you know, we've legalized marijuana and there's lots of good reasons that we've done that but we need to also prioritize the health and safety of the children and youth in our community because we're the only ones that can do that. And we can make different decisions locally than the state ordinances. And just like the speakers before me shared, this is new, this is, it, this is new. And we're gonna find out over the next couple decades about the impact doctors are seeing our students in their emergency rooms. And that's what, not, kids need to be in school and learning and growing, not in our emergency rooms, not experiencing mental health challenges. There are so many, and I'm not, and I'm not saying that not having this, I'm not gonna saying that not having this dispensary here is gonna eliminate the problem, it's not. But we need to do everything we can as a community of adults to mitigate it. And if this amplifies the problems because of the ease of access, it's a four minute walk from, the main campus, the main part of campus. It's a block and a half from the perimeter of campus. And it's super easy for kids to get there and get back to school on a break. 
So thank you for considering our, our, our concerns. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, at this time, I'll ask if any commissioners would like to ask questions of the school district. Uh, seeing none, we'd like to invite the applicant to make their presentation. Hello and welcome. Thank, thank you for your time. Um, Valerie was requesting, we have a member from WAM that wanted to speak in public comment that's kind of struggling. If, if they could go okay. before my presentation, we'd greatly appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Hi, I'm Valerie you... Skye, and this is my autistic son, Kai oh, Mangrum. Um, he <laughs> developed <laughs> seizures, <laughs> grand mal seizures, a few years ago. He has a Stanford neurologist. He's had many, many tests, sedation, MRI even, EEGs, all kinds of tests. Nothing has helped until I thankfully met uh, uh, Valerie Corral and um, her special uh, neural blend of CBD, THC, which she developed to help her own seizures, um, has been very helpful to my son's seizures. I don't know what I would have done without her. I, I'm, I, I really have PTSD from when he had his first seizure um, and he stopped breathing, terrible convulsions. So any reduction in his seizures is just a godsend. And um, he has oral aversions. So mm -hmm. it's impossible to give him pharmaceutical, and I've explored every option. They just don't make any kind of anti-seizure patches or <laughs> that kind of stuff, but I'm able to give him the CBD THC oil on a little cubes of Starbucks brownies, which he likes. And um, so that's the only way, and, and his seizures are now only once every few months. So it's been really great. Um, I've been pretty stressed out with um, um, when I'm losing their office space and worrying about what I'm going to do if I can't get that medicine for my son. Um, and, um, yeah, they've just been wonderful. Um, I don't know if you know their history, but um, yeah. Valerie Corral is the reason why we have the first yeah. Prop 215 medical marijuana, her her compassionate uh, dispensary is the first in the country uh, since 1993. And um, they never asked for any money. Um, and um, it's by donation only, only if you can. No one's denied. Um, and I just can't say enough that how important it is to have us have easy access to uh, this much needed medicine. Um, Thank you very much Thank for you. sharing tonight. Thank you for coming. At this time, I am going to ask everybody in the chambers to please remember that this is a public meeting. For many people, it's the first time they've ever spoken. It is much more stressful to do it in a chambers that is full of um, whether you're supporting or opposing. So I'm going to ask Welcome, everybody, and welcome your thoughts. But please refrain from um, making comments while people are speaking and respect their bravery for coming up to the microphone. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Can I add uh, 60 seconds? Actually, no. I'm oh, going to. OK. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you for Thank coming. you for your time. Hi. Um, Ryan, do you mind going to the first slide? Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Bryce Berryessa. I am a co-founder of the Hook Outlet. Uh, we have applied for a dispensary in partnership with WAM at the former Emily's Bakery location at 1129 Mission Street. Uh, when we embarked upon this journey a year ago, I did not think we'd be going before the Planning Commission, nor did I think that we'd get uh, such a 
wonderful and diverse uh, community response to uh, cannabis in Santa Cruz. So um, life is full of surprises, and uh, I'm happy to be on this journey with you. So let's begin. Um, I have been involved in cannabis in the county for a number of years. Uh, I was very active with the County of Santa Cruz ushering forth regulations back in 2010. I actually am the first uh, business to get a license in the unincorporated County of Santa Cruz. Uh, I am the first retail operator in the city of Watsonville as well as the city of Capitola. Uh, when I say I, I mean my organization. I am but one member of a great team. Um, I also was, uh, had the privilege to be on the board of directors of the largest trade association in the state, the California Cannabis Industry Association, and I'm a founding member of the California Cannabis Manufacturers Association. So I got to work very proactively and closely with state regulators during the transition from Proposition 215 uh, to ALMA through Prop 64, what we have right now. So uh, I am a huge proponent that cannabis regulations and legalization make for a safer community and a more responsible business operators. Um, next slide, please. So the reason I opened my first dispensary uh, in 2010 was actually uh, inspired by WAM. Um, I'm a firm proponent in medical cannabis. I believe that it is a viable alternative to pharmaceutical drugs and it provides affordable relief where pharmaceuticals have failed many people in our healthcare system. And uh, getting exposed to WAM and being part of the cannabis community really gave me a deep appreciation for its impact on the wellness and well-being of people. Um, so when I opened my first dispensary, my goal was to operate it at a break-even and give away as much cannabis as I possibly could through my compassion program. Uh, I'm proud to say that the last three years before legalization, my partner and I were able to give over $3 million uh, of medical cannabis through our compassion program to members of the Santa Cruz community. Um, so having this partnership with WAM is a dream come true. Compassionate access got decreased uh, with the advent of Prop 64. Uh, what we used to be able to give away that wasn't taxed or had the extra burden and cost of regulations became increasingly expensive and cost prohibited, prohibitive overnight. Uh, compassionate access all but disappeared in 2018, and uh, thankfully, due to Valerie Corral's uh, hard work, SB 34 was passed, and that allowed for a legal mechanism that wasn't taxed for compassionate free cannabis to now be administered and given away in the legal system. Um, and next, next slide, please. Um, so the use of both medical and recreational cannabis is consistent with the will and the majority of citizens in Santa Cruz. Uh, based on the voting records for ALMA, also known as Prop 64, uh, found that countywide 70% of the nearly 128,000 votes tallied and supported legalization. Um, through this process, we have uh, also undergone extensive community engagement um, to inform and have a fully transparent process. Uh, although there is a lot of voices of opposition here tonight, I think it's also fair to say that we have had overwhelming community support, both on social media, as I'm sure you've been inundated with emails, you're aware of that as well. And, um, you know, I think that we have a rich and storied history of cannabis and medical cannabis in Santa Cruz, and uh, that is present in the community uh, who very much still supports medical cannabis and supports both of our organizations. Um, and I, I think that also shows, and, you know, we we issued a petition of support about three days ago, and as of a few hours ago, we've already gotten uh, over a thousand signatures in support of this project. Please refrain. Next slide. Please refrain from any um, audible comment. So we're, we're not just dispensary. Our, our goal in the community has never been one of uh, just transaction. Um, we have always aimed to give back, and I think that this partnership with WAM exemplifies that. Uh, this collaboration will ensure that a segment of all of our sales go goes towards providing free or sliding scale cannabis to low-income patients. Uh, suffering from severe medical conditions like cancer, AIDS, multiple sclerosis, and epilepsy. Uh, this is a continuation of the service that WAM has been providing in our community for over 30 years. Um, and as of last year, uh, we have partnered with WAM and we're currently providing free weekly medical cannabis to 77 WAM members uh, at our treehouse location. 
securing this dispensary on the west side is pivotal to our goal of building that up to 200 members with pickup points at our uh, facility in Watsonville. Uh, on the west side where WAM has operated for a number of years and still has patients that need access to their medicine and also a, a, a treehouse. Um, so there's significant economic and social contributions of our partnership. As a 100% locally owned business, we are deeply vested in our community. Uh, despite the challenges the legal cannabis industry has endured, we've grown and increased our presence throughout the county. We have done this by investing in our team and our mission. Our total compensation for employees ensures a livable wage. We offer health benefits, retirement options, extensive training, and a positive supporting culture that values work-life balance. Since our inception, we've aimed to work with and support other hyper-local hyper organizations doing good in our community. We have partnered with dozens of artists, artisans, and nonprofit organizations and we have raised tens of thousands of dollars directly supporting Santa Cruz County organizations and community members. We do this through our events, our, our food and resource drives, our sowing the seeds for change, roundup for justice, and other community partnerships. Aligning with Santa Cruz vision. Um, if you have the opportunity to read Ryan's comprehensive staff report, uh, you'll see that our project aligns with uh, a, a lot of Santa Cruz's general plan, um, which emphasizes support for local businesses, community health, and sustainable practices. Uh, we actually uh, reach 17 objectives and policies under the Santa Cruz City general plan. Uh, the proposed use is consistent with five appropriate uses within the Mission Street Urban Design Plan. And this project meets five of the area-wide land use and redevelopment strategy plan objectives and policies for the west side zone of the city. Um, exceeding compliance. Uh, you know, as far as regu regulatory compliance goes, we've operated legal cannabis retail in the county for over a decade and have never received a citation or a violation from any government agency for our operations. Our record is impeccable. Our partners, WAM, have a long history of collaboration and cooperation with local government. Their reputation and their history of operations in this county is also impeccable. As pioneers in the regulated cannabis industry, we have worked proactively and collaboratively with the government on regulations that promote transparency and align with the health and safety of our community. We are a process-driven organization that consistently updates and refines our processes and our operation policies to ensure compliance with the constantly changing rules and regulations facing our nation, nascent industry. So let's, let's talk about our location. I think uh, a reason why so many of us are here tonight. Um, I think it's really important for the general public and for the Planning Commission to understand that strict zoning makes it incredibly difficult to find a compliant location in the city. Um, we searched for nearly half a year to secure our location at 1129 Mission Street. Uh, we made offers on two other properties prior to securing this location. Uh, given the lack of compliant inventory available, we had to purchase Emily's Bakery so we could obtain the lease. It wasn't available for lease. We actually had to buy the business so we could operate there. Uh, we did this only after confirming that the site met all zoning and setback requirements with senior city planning staff. In addition, we hired an independent land use consultant to assess the location's compliance and feasibility. After we got that report, we felt comfortable moving forward and offering to purchase the business. Um, one other thing about our location that I think is important is as you are assessing a site's feasibility, one of the restrictions are is that it's not located in close proximity to other dispensaries. So there's a buffer from around other dispensaries, but it's also subjective as to how many dispensaries are in a given area. This is the only zone on the map that is as far away from any other dispensary in the city as it possibly can be. So if we were to locate in Harvey West, we'd be close to Canna Cruz. If we were on the River Street Corridor or Ocean Street, we'd be close to Reefside and, um, and Kind Peoples. Uh, same thing, moving further down the west side, we'd be close to Three Bros. So you know, we strategically picked this location uh, based off the very limited options that we have. Um, the other thing that I do just want to highlight is 
even though there are options available, albeit a few of them in the zoning map, uh, federal banking restrictions prohibit any landlord that does not own their property outright from leasing to a commercial cannabis business. So while there might be 50 available parcels, we can only rent with landlords that are approved of our use and do not have a bank loan. They must own the property outright. This further limits and restricts our ability to find a compliant location in the city. Uh, education and community initiatives. Um, Valerie Corral and I have been actively involved in community organizations that aim to promote the health and well-being of county residents, particularly our youth. We have participated with community, community prevention partners to inform and shape public policy that promotes the public good. We have participated in United Way's Talk It Up, Lock It Up campaign, which aims to educate adults on the risks of, not sec of securing cannabis and other substances in the home away from children and pets. I have since 2018 provided lock boxes at cost at all of my dispensaries to our patients to securely lock up pharmaceuticals and cannabis products in the home. We have worked with the county on obtaining grants for the polysubstance impaired driving campaign, which secured a $500,000 grant from the office, uh, office of traffic safety and disseminated information to all of our patrons to inform them on the hazards of combining pharmaceutical drugs, alcohol, and cannabis while driving. We have deployed educational resources and social media initiatives aimed at spreading awareness on safe cannabis use, harm reduction, uh, resources on providing resources on county mental health and addiction resources, and providing information supporting parents on how to address and deter youth substance. We have done this for years, long before we have ever put in this application because it is part of our core values and our commitment to being a good steward of the community. Proactively addressing the school board concerns with informed solutions. Uh, we were first notified of uh, the concern back in September. Uh, we reached out to Superintendent Monroe and uh, were able to have a meeting with a senior school staff. Um, we left that meeting having a better understanding of some of their concerns and we made some changes to our initial design. Uh, some of the positive uh, solutions that came out of that meeting is uh, I left it and amended our exterior design to ensure that no transactions or cannabis products are viewable from any public right of way. Our initial design had a glass facade, which may have allowed people walking by to see cannabis products on the inside, as is consistent at dispensaries such as Reefside and Kind Peoples. Uh, we, have, we have changed that. Um, we resubmitted our proposed signage plan and decreased the proposed exterior signage to one singular monument sign. Uh, we did have originally signage planned to be on the building. Uh, the proposed signage plan now has no cannabis signs on the building. We will not advertise our brand partners. There will be nothing to identify that it is a dispensary on the building with the exception as you can see in the rendering here, a single logo sign and one green cross. Um, given that there is a issue with use substance use in the schools, uh, we don't deny that, it's, it's a problem. Uh, we offered to work with the school to revamp some uh, material that we had worked with with community prevention partners and I had worked with other cannabis uh, organizations back in 2018 around harm reduction, uh, resources for how parents can talk to youth, um, and also uh, resources for uh, youth substance and mental health services in the community. Uh, as a direct result of that meeting, we launched safecannabis.net, uh, which lives on our website as an educational repository for resources for the community. Um, furthermore, uh, given the concerns of high school, uh, or excuse me, given the concerns of school staff, um, they mentioned they were worried that an 18-year-old with a medical card might be able to come in and purchase product and disseminate it on campus. So I had voluntarily recommended to staff that a condition of our approval be that we do not transact cannabis to anyone under the age of 19. This, we would be the only dispensary out of 16 operating in the county that had this provision. Uh, I do also think just it's important to note that for the three dispensaries that I currently have, uh, since 2018, only 3.8% of our customers that have come through our doors have been between the ages of 18 and 20 with a valid medical card. It is a very small percentage of the total sales and transactions that we do as a legal regulated organization in the county.
Um, you heard a lot of educators and uh, concerned members of our community talk about issues with substance use and um, use in the schools. And we are firmly opposed to use substance use. Um, we've proactively worked to educate against it and uh, ensure that our operations do not provide a negative impact on the youth and that we do everything we possibly can to ensure that our products are not getting in their hands. And I think that it's really important to look at the data. And so in letters that you've gotten and in pills that you've gotten, it, it uh, talks about the Healthy Kids Survey and that use is going up. And I think that it's, it's important to look at that. Next slide, please. And actually look at the trends and look at what has happened since legalization. So according to the Santa Cruz Healthy Kids Survey, uh, from 15, you know, from 2015 to 2018, use was actually flat. What you can see across the board, whether it's grade seven, eight, nine, or non-traditional schools, that beginning with legalization in 2018, when we added two more dispensaries to the county and we put them in much more visible areas, there is a steep decrease in use, substance use. So this current one is current marijuana use, one or more days in the past 30 days. Next slide, please. Where is there that gap in the middle? Is it just a missed year? Uh, I don't. I, I don't see a gap in the Good middle. Right Go back. I, I couldn't. Hold it. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so, so for the for countywide, we only have data up to 2021. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, to no problem. Um, so, uh, very drunk or high seven or more times. Lifetime results, as you can see, beginning in 2018, there was also a steep decline, which coincides with legalization. Next slide. Sorry, Jermaine. Uh, lifetime alcohol and drug use on school property. Uh, once again we see a steep decline beginning in 2018, which coincides with cannabis legalization. Please go to the next slide. So we actually went and pulled uh, data, particularly for Santa Cruz High School, because um, we didn't have recent data uh, countywide. And so once again, you can see that uh, with the exception of current use in the last 30 days, uh, which went up nominally, but is still uh, 11 percent less than in 2018 when legalization occurred uh, it also coincides with a decrease in student use so while there is still an issue on campus there is a very compelling and fact-based argument based off the same research that the city schools have presented that cannabis legalization is not contributing to use substance use we could actually see that it has gone down across the board based off of legalization and the data here tonight. Please go to the next slide. Furthermore, I'd like to also reiterate that this is consistent with what we've seen nationally. Uh, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention Youth Risk Behavioral Survey revealed key findings about teen cannabis use in relation to the opening of legal dispensaries. What the Centers for Disease Control found is there's a decline in teen cannabis use. This study published last year found a consistent decrease in both current and lifetime cannabis use among high school students over the past decade. The decline is notable since it occurred after the uptrend in usage from 2009 to 2013 before the opening of legal dispensaries. This is consistent finding, there are consistent findings across studies. Other studies, including those funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse and research conducted in states like Colorado and California, also found no increase in youth cannabis use post legalization. In fact, some of these studies indicate a decline or no significant change in adolescent cannabis use. Next slide. So one, one thing that was also brought up is uh, the ease of use of obtaining fake IDs. So I wanna be really clear that there is not a single iota of evidence that students or minors are using fake IDs at licensed dispensaries. There has not been a single citation or a violation of any dispensary in the county as confirmed by the Santa Cruz Police Department and is also confirmed by the County Cannabis Licensing Office. Obtaining a fake ID is different than actually gaining access to our facilities with a fake ID. We have some of the most stringent checks and balances of any business in the state that requires identification. What happens is that first there's a physical examination of IDs to confirm against physical characteristics. We make sure that the picture matches what's on the ID. 
We use black light illumination of IDs to check for UV validation markings. We scan the front of the ID to ensure the line and font spacing conform to regulations. We scan the back of the ID to ensure that the barcode data that gets scanned into our system is consistent with what's on the ID. Uh, all of the above are required under a dedicated surveillance camera by state law. When we scan these IDs by law, we have to have a picture of the face of the person that's submitting the ID, and we have to retain that for 90 days. Youth and others with fake IDs avoid scanning and black light checks to evade ID capture, embarrassment, and the threat of reporting. Because of the state ID check requirements, youth presentment of fake IDs is not an issue we face in this industry. Shoulder tapping is also non-existent due to the requirements of exterior camera and security surveillance. So to be clear, there is no evidence to support that youth are using fake IDs to gain access to, le to legal cannabis. I also wanted to outline that studies highlight the effectiveness of ID policies at recreational cannabis outlets in California to prevent underage access to minors. Uh, a research article from the Journal of Safety Research in September of 2022 investigated the likelihood of underage youth obtaining cannabis from licensed recreational outlets in California where recreational cannabis is legal. In all cases, pseudo underage patrons were required to show age identification to enter the licensed outlets. The study concludes that licensed recreational outlets in California are effective in preventing underage customers from accessing cannabis. This may be due to the strong incentives for outlet owners and managers to comply with the law to avoid legal consequences. Next slide, please. So another issue that was brought up is, pardon me, got to get caught up with my notes. All right. Um, another issue that's brought up is that having a cannabis dispensary on Mission Street is going to normalize cannabis and that students and people walking by are going to be subjected to it. So once again, I want to reiterate that based off of the school's concerns, we've amended our signage plan. If you take a moment to look at the proposed uh, uh, model of what it will look like, uh, that is what you will see. There is one green cross. There will be no references to cannabis. There will be no logos, no flashing green lights, no neon signs, no guys going like this dancing around trying to attract youth. We will have a very discreet and professional uh, facility and I think that it's also a little bit of a stretch given the fact that cannabis permeates pop culture from fashion to music. It's undeniably a part of American society and it is prevalent in all aspects of media for better or worse. Our business prioritizes discretion with just a single compliant monument sign. And as I just said, we will not advertise on our building and our design ensures no transaction or products will be seen from any public right away. It is required by law that all products are purchased in an opaque exit bag. You will not see people with cannabis products leaving the facility. You will not see what they do when they're in the facility. Aligning with established precedents. Santa Cruz cannabis guidelines were formulated in 2010 and again updated in 2017, receiving broad endorsement from residents, law enforcement, city planners, finance officials, and the city council. The city's dispensaries have consistently demonstrated responsible operation with adverse effects on the, without adverse effects on the community. Ocean Street is a bustling commercial route frequented by tourists and families heading to the boardwalk and the beach. It hosts two city dispensaries. Comparable in proximity to Canna Cruz's distance from Kirby School and the County Office of Education mirrors our proposed distance to Santa Cruz County High School. They are the exact same distance from Kirby School as we are from Santa Cruz County High School. Mean meanwhile, Reefside operates less than 60 feet from Marianne's Ice Cream, a spot incredibly popular with minors, and Three Bros is situated across from youth-centric spots like New Leaf, Ice Cream on Fair, and the Green Ray, Green Ray Trail, which hundreds of miners pass every single day. These establishments operate responsibly with no negative implications for the community or youth, even with their close presence to areas frequented by those under the age of 18. Given our longstanding history of compliant operations in this community, we implore you to hold us accountable to the same standards and established precedents offered to these responsible businesses. Our final appeal 
Our partnership with WAM and our proposed project exemplifies Santa Cruz's dedication to health, safety, and sustainability, and it fulfills many objectives of the city's general plan as outlined in the staff report and this presentation. With a strong commitment to strict regulatory compliance, we assure the highest operating standards. This project is born from our deep love for the city, our desire to see WAM continue its mission to serve the chronic and terminally ill, and our belief in contributing many meaningful benefits to the community. We've embarked on this path, chosen our location, and met every city criterion in good faith, knowing that we are secure in our investment of time, money, and resources, because we meet 100% of the rules and regulations that have been carefully crafted through the city's public process. We look forward to the continued collaboration with government, law enforcement, the community, including the schools as we move forward on this project. We respectfully call upon the Planning Commission to acknowledge the robust community backing and the thoughtful preparations taken to ensure this project's success and compliance. Your approval would allow us to progress together for the betterment of Santa Cruz. Um, and because I have an objective, and there's something that I want in this process. I get that that mirrors my message. And so I would also like to note that I attended a webinar last year from the California League of Cities. For those of you that are familiar with cannabis regulation, the League of Cities and the Police Chief Union were the two organizations that were the most vocally opposed to Proposition 64. The reason that we have local control and why we're having this conversation in the first place is primarily due to compromises made with the League of Cities and the Police Chiefs Unions to allow local communities to determine how and who they would allow in their community as it relates to cannabis. And so in 2018, the League of Cities was an adversary. Uh, just four years into regulation, there's some information from a webinar that they did to the greater community. And in that, they stated that 91% of Americans believe in cannabis should be legal in some form, according to a survey conducted by the Pew Research Center. Two thirds, as of, as of this survey, two thirds of cannabis sales in California take place in the illicit market, according to a study conducted by the Reason Foundation. California cannabis regulations ensure products are safe for consumers of age and prevent underage youth from purchasing their products. 100% of IDs are checked at dispensaries to avoid selling to youth. States that have legalized medical and or adult use saw a decrease in the likelihood of underage cannabis use. Authorizing commercial cannabis businesses has been shown to reduce neighborhood crime, increase property values, and spur economic development. This is research based, uh, th these statements are based off of research from JAMA Pediatrics, the Journal of Safety Research, the Substance Abuse Initiative, the Journal of Adolescent Health, and the Centers for Disease Control. So once again, I'm advocating that cannabis in our community that is regulated is held to a higher standards and it creates a safer community. I do not argue with the educators here that are telling you that there's a problem in our schools. I do not fault the parents here that are concerned about substance use amongst our youth. I live a block away from Mission Hill. I have seven and nine-year-old boys that will attend that school. I want them to have a safe environment. I think the problem is there's a challenge to distinguish between the three markets of cannabis that are running parallel right now. We have the traditional market, which is the black market. We have a psychoactive hemp market, and we have a highly regulated legal market. The legal market is not providing products to youth. We have every incentive to be responsible members of our community, and I really hope that you allow us to uh, continue along our path and uh, enact our partnership with WAM, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Berryessa. At this time, excuse me, once again, I'm going to ask members of the public who are very welcome here to refrain from audible comments. This is the time for commission members to um, ask questions of the applicant. Does anybody have questions? Commissioner Kennedy. Uh, I appreciate all the, the, the good causes you're donating to the education for school for students. Uh, would you be open to a more direct contribution to the nearby schools, like 
$13,000 every year. That might make a big yeah, impact you know, for those schools. Um, you know, like I'm, my, my kid goes to Bayview. He's headed to Missionville. Sure, understood. So, so I, I think one thing that I missed in the slide when I talked about is the tax revenue that we'll generate. Um, I had notes, the and there's, there's some things on the slide, but um, you know, our, our estimated tax revenue, 63,000 of that, I believe. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Yeah, so about 63,000 of our estimated tax revenue would be contributed to the City of Santa Cruz Children's Fund. Um, I realize I'm piling on, but yeah. would you be open to going further than that, just direct to the schools? Um, just like in general. Yeah, I mean, I, I would tell you that in general, through our Sowing the Seeds program, we partner with hyper-local organizations every two months to raise money and spread awareness, and that is something that we've done consistently since 2020. Okay. Um, Again, and, I'm, I'm acknowledging mm -hmm. all that you already do. Yeah. I just uh, want to get a little I, more pointed with that. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I do also want to reiterate that we've reached out to both the PTAs of Mission Hill and Santa Cruz High School. Um, I have asked uh, parents that have written us that are... are uh, concerned to organize community meetings and we would love and welcome a proactive approach to address these issues like I said this is my neighborhood so we will um, be more than willing to be an active member and participant in that community you know our, our PTO yeah. budgets 35 grand a year you know <laughs> the IAPOP teachers 3500 bucks just a thought I can't blame the guy for trying any other questions from commissioners yes Commissioner Paul Hamas. Thank you. Um, yeah, really quickly. Sorry, let me pull this up really quick. Um, I think this actually might be more for Valerie. I'm sorry, is it Coral or Corral? Corral. Corral. Um, I'm curious about the WAM side of this. Um, so what type of products do WAM patients usually try to procure? Well, some procure flour, uh, but the most useful and most effective products that we offer for most seriously ill uh, patients who fall into the category of uh, access, of, well, actually, nobody in WAM buys cannabis. So uh, primarily there are oils, which are d uh, distilled products. There are um, extractions, which are oils that are, are offered to Patients who have cancers and other ailments that are taken orally, they don't taste great. Most kids really wouldn't want to take them, I should think. We've never had that occur in 30 years of doing this work. Uh, we also offer topical and, um, and uh, tinctures. So they're, it's very limited amount, but among those, there are several different specifically uh, um, created cannabis products that our members have found to be useful for specific treatment and for, specific, for really to relieve with specificity any different type of uh, ailment. So it can be from cancer use, which would be different from epileptic seizures, and especially that with youth. Um, they're not the same doses, but every dose is individually prescribed or I can't say prescribed, but offered. And every person is different and unique. Yeah, and that was going to be my next question. Is uh, I know that there's um, you know maximums um, that a particular patient can walk away with in any one particular visit. Say, um, what are the quantities normally that WAM patients are looking to carry away? Just off the top of your head, I don't need like figures. Um, but well, they can. It obviously depends yeah, on what they're yeah, taking. Yeah, they can, they can right? pick up weekly, but uh, I think that the legal dose. <clears throat> is 1,000 milligrams for a medical marijuana patient, a patient with a cannabis card. That's uh, specifically from this, his or her physician, or their physician. Right, right. But um, that's not the average amount that a person walks with. But that's a, a maximum. Right, right. <clears throat> okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then this is for Bryce. Does um, Sorry, Mr. Berrius. <laughs> um so the hook has a Capitola and Watsonville location. And um, I guess I'm curious is, do they offer delivery? Uh, we do not, but we do have a drive-through uh, option at our treehouse okay. store. And does the, um, are there, wow, you have a drive-through. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> 
That was going to be my next question, is with the delivery, or I'm sorry, the drive through I thought the drive throughs were limited. Maybe that's just in the city. Um, we're the we're city. one of only three in the entire state um, hey. due to uh, state regulations. Okay, awesome. Sorry, I'm going down a wormhole here. Um, okay, great. Then that next question doesn't really matter. Okay, thank you. Any other questions that commissioners have? I have one more. Okay. Uh, so I live right by Three Bros. You know, you walk by the winery, there's a winery smell. There's quite a strong smell by Three Bros, quite a lot. I don't mind it myself, but um, this would be a lot different because you're not growing marijuana there. Is that... Yeah, I'll... I'll uh, you have the option to start growing later, just in, in terms of a yeah, wafting smell. Yeah, no, not at all. Our, our entitlement is specifically for retail. We can't do any Great. cultivation or manufacturing. Um, all of our products are prepackaged, and so uh, there's not really a smell at dispensaries because there's not any open product to disseminate odors. Um, and then you... I saw you have a, a, a smell system in the ventilation yeah. already anyway on top of that. Okay. But in terms of, like, you know, kind of, like, broadcasting in the neighborhood, I think that's important. Yeah, um, the neighborhood will probably not be able to smell anything differently than they smell now with our operations. Thanks. Okay, Commissioner McKelvey. Uh, Mr. Barry, I said, great presentation. I, I was, it's very compelling. <clears throat> Thanks for your time. Um, you've spoken about, you've said pretty definitively that uh, youth are not using fake IDs, et cetera. Um, seems to be some question about that, but can you talk in any general terms about challenges you have run into? Um, what, you know, there, there's a raft of conditions on this approval, you know, whether it's people smoking on the premises or, you know, any, the, the odor question, any of these things. Have, can you talk a little bit about things that may have happened in your experience that you either didn't expect or uh, gave you any concern? Over the time you've been operating, how much time of do you have? Facilities. Um. Well, no, no, I'm, 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 yeah, I don't, I don't mean a laundry list of every, you know, thing might have happened, but some of the things are pretty important to the community in terms of just access. I don't really, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the normalization question, but right. um, there are very significant concerns that people have about their own kids, about other people's kids. Um, and I'd, I'd just like to know whether you can kind of give a, uh, a little summary of things that, that concern you, that, that yeah, you know, um, how you control things and sure. yeah, what I mean, you I, might be concerned about. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can talk about two off the top of my head. Um, so we've spent a lot of time in the last month working on a conflict resolution uh, training for all of our staff and management um, and how to handle uh, a aggressive, uh, hyper-emotional situations. So we had an incident, that, uh, a, a traffic incident that happened outside of the dispensary that escalated into a parking lot with threats of physical violence and firearms. Um, that it, it had nothing to do with the operations of the dispensary, but our manager was uh, standing in between two individuals trying to de-escalate a situation, and it was incredibly stressful for us. And uh, it was with uh, a veteran who is a member of our facility. So although the, the it, it didn't involve us, it involved someone we knew. And so, you know, there was concerns that he was going to come back because he was upset and frustrated. And, you know, so we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to uh, train our staff for de-escalation measures. We deal with the general public, and a lot of people that we deal with uh, use it as a medicine, and some people are using it for post-traumatic stress disorder. Some people are using it for anxiety. And so, you know, our staff have a very hard job. Um, I say that they're a combination of pharmacists, friends, uh, psychiatrists, and, and bud tenders, right? It's multifaceted, the members of the community we have to deal with. So that's constantly a challenge, trying to navigate that in a place of compassion. I, I, was, I was, maybe I'm being too broad, but I'm being specific to your operation. I know you're talking about those might be your clients oh, or, or people that are affected, but uh, can you give an idea of how often you might have uh, Circumstances that are challenging, or or incidents that might occur that are that are, again, that give you concern over you know being having everyone safe in the neighborhood and and uh, in your facility. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm I'm never concerned about the safety or the impact of our operations. I mean, we have 
three dispensaries that have operated successfully without issue for a number of years now. Uh, Treehouse, uh, you know, my first dispensary in 2010, Treehouse opened in 2018, our Capitola, Capitola store opened in 2020, and our Watsonville store opened in 2021. Um, <clears throat> given the robust security measures, which I didn't get into, that are required of us, uh, we have arguably the safest businesses in the county. We utilize a, a very high technology uh, security system called Verkata that utilizes artificial intelligence. Uh, it flags any suspicious activity uh, and immediately alerts us. Um, and when we're not open, it goes to a human that does active monitoring if there's any motion or suspicious activity and they can alert the police department and management in real time. Um, I get clips sent to my phone at night if people enter zones that aren't allowed for. And I, th and I think that because you know, we go for a very proactive visual deterrent approach because um, I think that that's the safest way. Uh, people are very aware when they come on our premises and our property that they're being monitored and the security measures we take. And then, you know, we also have security staff at all times when we're open, which I think um, provides uh, a little bit more safety and, uh, you know, awareness for people that are coming in. Coming in. You know, I think my our biggest challenge is honestly are, are operational. It's very, very hard to operate a regulated business in the cannabis industry. There's a million rules that we have to abide by. Uh, we're getting extorted by every business that we have to have a partnership with that's not cannabis because they perceive that we have a lot more resources than we have. Uh, we are taxed at incredibly higher rates than other businesses. And so, um, you know, my, my challenges are less about proximity and more about, you know, the, the, the failure of regulations and, you know, the, how we get treated as a business. Thank, thank you. you very much. Any other questions yeah. for, for the applicant? Okay. Thank you very much. And with that, I'm going to open the public hearing. For starters, would you indicate uh, those in attendance by raising your hand whether you intend to speak tonight? Okay, I'm seeing quite a few hands. Everyone is welcome. And um, thank you so much for coming. We really would like to hear your opinion. Um, I'm going to offer everybody one minute at the microphone. I'm going to ask that you please um, if you sign in. And if you're comfortable, tell us um, who you are when you start. And uh, Thank you very much. Were you going to? Oh. Excuse me, I, just, uh, I was uh, supposed to just tag on to the end of Bryce's. Uh, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm really sorry. This is not the time. Um, we're, we've opened the public hearing. OK. So uh, you could come up as a member of the public, um, stand in line with public comment. I thank you for your time. Um, yeah, this is my first time at a, one of these things. So, um, My name is Stephen Walcher. I'm a general practitioner, medical doctor in Santa Cruz here. And um, I'm here. Um, I, I, first of all, I want to acknowledge my colleagues who testified earlier. I share the same concerns about youth use of cannabis. I'm a recovering uh, uh, heavy-duty cannabis user as a teenager. And I, I, I don't think it really helped me, although I kind of survived it and uh, got through medical school anyway. Um, but uh, what I want to say here is, uh, you know, uh, I've, I know Valerie uh, for over 15, 15 some odd years. I've been a cannabis doctor in this town uh, until legalization, basically. Um, but I just want to say Valerie Correll is, my, is a hero of mine. I love her. I have worked closely with her. Uh, she is, I can't think of another person in my life who uh, shares the values around uh, service and uh, com commitment to compassionate care. I also work on a, a, a donation <clears throat> donation basis as a physician, and we share that. Uh, we have that kinship. I have sent her so all my serious patients. Okay. I've sent her to Valerie, and um, I think uh, Valerie and what she's doing. She's an endangered species, and we need to support her and and honor her. Thank uh, you for your community. comments. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And thank you for your service. Um, the line is back here. I was. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, we. My daughter's really sick. I just really would like to say something. I didn't. You know, um, the time for the applicant's uh, report is concluded, and they already received some extra time. We re would really welcome your comments. Just... But please stand in line with everyone else. I'm sorry, it's just not fair. I really, really welcome your comments. 
there's a line. <laughs> it had been gathering. There is a line. My name is Jared Brick. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. There isn't an actual line. Yeah, oh, I line. apologize. <laughs> to me, it looks like there's a line going out of the room. I'm, I'm going to okay. pass to her. Um, oh. I have two children here that I've kept here for an hour and a half, so I'm just going to speak my one minute and take them home. Okay. Okay. All I'm, right. I'm, uh, once again, we're ha this, is that, this is that meeting. Everybody's okay. comments are welcome. And yes, please go ahead for My one name minute. is Jared Brick. I'm a local business kids. owner of seven years in Santa Cruz County. I run a media company, also a soccer coach. I also have a son who goes to Mission Hill. I am much more concerned with alcohol being sold at every store he can go to anywhere in the county, Safeway, the markets, the gas stations, right in front of him. He can open a fridge. He can touch it. He can see it. Much more concerned about that. You could not have had a better, cleaner business owner than Bryce, who is a co-parent of Pacific Elementary School with my other children. And so the concerns I hear are valid as a general concern, but for local cannabis dispensaries, you could not have a more accurate, integrity, transparent business than Mr. Berryessa and The Hook. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ramey Clark, and um, I was just going to say my daughter in uh, 2019 was diagnosed with a really rare, deadly degenerative form of um, epilepsy, DNM1. It's medically resistant, and it is degenerative. There was, like, no... She had, a, she had ataxia, she's nonverbal. She has multiple seizures all day long, um, varying in different kinds. It usually turns into the Lennox Gestalt syndrome. There literally was no hope for her. Most kids with her syndrome die at uh, the age of six. There's only 67 in the country, um, worldwide, I'm sorry, with her diagnosis. She was the first at Stanford ever to be diagnosed with this. Um, if it wasn't for Val and Wham, like my daughter, not only would not have a quality of life, but she most likely would be not where she's at because she cannot process pharmaceuticals. Um, the 15 minutes after we uh, gave her um, their NeuroBlend, she stopped shaking. Um, yeah, so I'm just saying I have another nine-year-old, okay. and without her, my daughter would probably be. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. And we are going up in line, so if you intend to speak, please do get in line. We will, please sign in before you speak. Um, everyone will have a chance. Please line up. We do not call you from the list. Uh, signing in really helps the clerk get your name right. That's right. Doing the, doing the, the minutes. Okay. I proceed. Wait one second. Hang on. All right. Everyone's now in line <laughs> waiting to speak. Thank, Thank you, you very much for coming. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gavin Kogan. Um, I, I wanted to address, there's obviously nobody in here that's in favor of youth access to cannabis. That's an obvious issue. What I want to point out to you is I really encourage you not to fall for the bait of trying to litigate, again, this issue of whether or not access to cannabis, or youth access to cannabis, um, is something that needs to be revisited. In, in this situation, the 600 foot is already, we've already vetted this issue out. The 600 foot buffer is the result of countless meetings with public health officials, zoning officials, law enforcement. It's already been determined. So I'm asking that you look at this as the law that is already informed by the issues that are presented to you today. Don't relitigate those issues. And the last thing I wanted to point out is given the fact that this applicant has followed the law to the T, to deny it at this stage would be grossly unfair. The school board should address this issue, not in this, in this forum, but rather change the law elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Good evening, my name is Wendy. I'm a nurse practitioner. I used to work at Cabrillo in student health. I have a daughter who's been through school and granddaughters who have been through all their whole life here now in college. And I know for a fact that high, high schools that are not close to dispensaries have problems with the kids having um, access to THC, whether there's a dispensary close by or not. It's, it's endemic. 
And um, from what I understand as an educator and a healthcare provider, they're mostly getting it from their friends and the family and black market. And since we've had legalization, it's made it harder for them to get the stuff that, that we're getting as adults. And what it's done for me um, as an aging adult is really helped me with arthritis. And I was never a person who went to marijuana for the high. I wanted, I wanted to feel better. And I couldn't take NSAIDs after 2014. And marijuana's made a huge difference. And we have a healing community here. And we're not hip anymore. The <laughs> kids see us comments. going to the dispensary and think, oh, God, it's for the old people. <laughs> I'll condense so my five minutes and I'm Valerie Corral. I'll condense my five minutes into a couple of seconds. So I've actually been speaking here for 30 years, so maybe some of you have heard it. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I want to say, if, kid, if any parents here are funding their children to be able to shop at dispensaries, that is an astonishment. Kids cannot afford dispensary prices. I can't afford dispensary prices. And there's something that's profoundly important for us to look at. This is an, it's endemic, it's a social problem that we're faced with. Our children are anxious, they are upset, they are scared. This, these problems must be addressed, and our fears, that's the same thing that we share, we love our community, and all of us share these fears together. That makes us allies more than enemies. There's not anybody in here who isn't concerned about children and their well-being. They're our future, and they're also our present. We work with children, and I've worked with... <laughs> children as young as three months who are still alive at 16 years old. Right, I'm going to grant you another minute just because of your I, I appreciate that. Thank you. I, am, I want to say that our ability, we've been moved twice because our landlords had to refinance. We're done. We're, we're financially spent. There's no more opportunity for us to serve our members. And we have to stay functioning because there is no other way for people who are sick and dying, people who are financially marginalized, to access, access this medicine, and specifically the type of medicines that we provide, which are unique in and of themselves and are dictated by the needs of our members. So I ask you, please, I implore you to look beyond the fear, a valid fear, but not one that this dispensary will be contributing to. And I thank you for your time, and I thank you. I know it's hard work, and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, my name is Chuck Berg, and I'm the landlord uh, for Treehouse. And I just want to say that Bryce Berryessa is a gentleman, keeps his word, very responsible, and he overexceeds expect expectations consistently. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Hi, I'm Michelle Newman. And um, as a former teacher, I completely understand the schools are rife with this. I mean, I know what the kids are doing. We all know what the kids are doing. And it's true that they can get it and they don't have to go to the dispensary. And I've seen those things. I know that they have the little, you know, the black light to prove the ID. They're, they're not going to get into this dispensary. But what I want to speak to is this man is my next door neighbor. And when they moved in, they are the most amazing family. I want to say what a wonderful father he is. His kids are incredible. He's completely engaged as a wonderful father. And uh, when I watch his character, I'm just going, I wish all parents were as involved in their ch with their children and caring as much as, as he and his wife are. And um, I just really want to say he's a very good bu businessman. He's diligent. And he really cares about the community. Thank you and he doesn't smoke comments. at home. And he, they, we don't have pot all around. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your comments. Next speaker. Paul Howard. Uh, you all are great. Uh, I'm right? all about a win-win. Excuse win. me? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I'm really trying to run a fair meeting. And I think we have a line. Well, it, it has nothing to do with the list. I'm the second person after Val. So whoever no, has spoke and the gentleman I, before. I'm really I, sorry. We're trying. The, the meeting process is to stand in line. 
All right. Please stand Thank in line and you. we no, no. welcome your speaking. I was two after Val. So. Well, it, at, the list has nothing to do with order. We are not calling okay. people off the list. My apologies. Okay. Thank you very much for coming and we welcome your comments after you stand in line. Next speaker. I think the, the line concept is a little blurry because the room is so full. So to me, it looks like we have a solid line out the back. Hi, my name is Dr. Suzanne Lerner. I'm a clinical psychologist for over 20 years in the community and also donate my time to help educate the public. I care, like all of you, um, the school board and all the people here um, about our children and the tremendous strains they're under and the addictive that's been um, addressed. I do want to say, though, that prohibition proximity has never been found to be a very effective way to deal with substance abuse. What we know is that trauma, the adverse ch children's experience, leads to greater emotional and physical problems. They analyze a huge study and stress. I think we need to do more, not less. I think this proximity issue, while well-meaning, and I sincerely support everyone who's come up here to speak today, is kind of a red herring, and that we need to have programs in schools to reduce stress, deal with trauma, and help kids learn communication skills where they know how to say yes and no under pressure. Those are the kind of things that help. Dr. Lori Layden in Monterey County has a program at the middle school that's been tremendously effective in helping reduce um, stress, emotional disorders, and more pro-social activity. And I can Thank present that comments. information. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Anna Paganelli. I'm a psychotherapist. I'm also a next door neighbor of Santa Cruz Residential Recovery. You may have gotten in your mail, in the email, uh, some information from me. The concern I have is Santa Cruz Residential Recovery is within 600 feet of the Emily's property. And we, I'm a, I love weed more than I wish, but, um, and I love the dispensaries. I think they're the safest way to have weed be distributed. I encourage them, their use for people, but the placement by Santa Cruz Residential Recovery, it is already a difficult, I, I love living next to them and they're a difficult neighbor. And putting a dispensary that close is a little bit like having a bar right next to uh, a sober living house. Try <clears throat> living next door. Excuse me, the, please address the, the commission. Um, it's. So I don't see how it fits within the regulations from the Santa Cruz um, marijuana, uh, sorry, from the cannabis license and regulation site on the Santa Cruz website. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Good evening. My name is Casey O'Brien, and I am the Director of Student Services at Santa Cruz City Schools. And I'm here this evening representing the uh, Administrators and Managers Association. There's a large group of us that are assistant principals, principals, directors, uh, supervisors, and coordinators for the school district. And I, I assume you received our letter uh, with our my members signing that letter. And um, you know, I'll say what other people have said, that we we do not have an issue with dispensaries, but we have an issue with the proximity. Um, it would, it's just a fact that if kids have that access um, and they have fake IDs, um, they can get in there pretty easily at break or lunch. And I can imagine a student standing, getting a muffin at, at Emily's, standing in the front of the line and having to move backwards while someone walks into and out of a dispensary. Um, that That's going to normalize further what's already extremely normalized. Um, I've been uh, an administrator for 21 years on the school site, 17 years as a principal, and I've seen a significant increase on campus. Um, I've had to carry a student out of the forest because they had greened out. Um, this, the proximity is just a big concern for us, so please vote against this. Thank you very much for your comments. Good evening. My name is Deborah Feldstein, and I am a parent of two students at Santa Cruz High School, 
No one here disputes the value of medical usage or Mr. Barrios's integrity as a business person. We are here because we are concerned about the safety of our youth, and we are not here because of just fear. I have worked with youth for the majority of my 30-year career. I volunteer at the high school, and I have a house in a yard full of high school students every weekend, and I know what is happening. And they do have medical cards. My son's a senior. I hear them talk about it, and I volunteer every Friday with the Interact Club that I supervise. I am with students. They themselves have concerns. They said this is ridiculous. They said that this is going to interfere with their learning. They have fears. Um, Ms. Boyer, who is the principal of the school, has done study groups. There are students who are members of the principal's advisory committee who have expressed their concern. And so I ask you to take into consideration the safety of our youth. And lastly, I do just want to correct the record that there is um, within the law the 600-foot usage, as Anna Paganelli just stated, a recovery center, um, which is right next to the high school and within the 600-foot uh, regulation. Thank you for your comments. Hello, my name is uh, Jeffrey Hickey. I'm the owner of a restaurant in Aptos called Soul Salad, um, soon to be a restaurant in the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, I expect to be, I think I have to have an administrative use hearing, so I'll probably be in front of this board during that process, maybe in the next couple months. Um, not trying to conjoin the two issues. However, um, I hope that if a regulation says for me 600 feet or something that's very specific, I hope that the Planning Commission can agree that if a business uses a non-arbitrary provision to invest in the community of Santa Cruz, obtain property, develop plans for new development, that said regulation is not changed or told, told the rule is actually the spirit of 800 feet or 600 feet. Um, my father-in-law has late stage Parkinson's. Um, we get him um, medicinal cannabis from the Hook Outlet. Um, the Hook Outlet is a good community member. They support art, music, community center events, and thank you. Thank you for your comments. Hello, thank you very much. My name is Mark Paul Goodman. Thank you for having this hearing, so to speak, and uh, giving the community opportunity to talk. I've been a resident of uh, Santa Cruz for 28 years. I'm extremely active with community service. I love this community. My previous spouse was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer and uh, her pain just continued to increase over the four years that it took from her to go from diagnosis to death. She got to the point where even uh, morphine could not help her unless she was completely uh, semi-comatose. Uh, we lived in Arizona at the time. Medical marijuana wasn't an option. It wasn't legal. We have that option now. Please don't take the opportunity for RAM and uh, to be able to have this access for its patients, for its, for its people that it contributes to. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Hi, I'm Stephanie. I work at the Hook Outlet. I am also the single mother of a freshman student at Harbor High. I too am concerned with keeping our youths off of drugs like alcohol and cannabis. I personally use cannabis to cope with anxiety and insomnia. I believe in cannabis as medicine and view it as a safer alternative to alcohol for parents. The best way that I can prevent my son from using cannabis is to talk with him, to educate him about the dangers of using it while his brain is still developing, and to lay down clear rules and consequences for using. I do know that the closest place my son can access cannabis is at home. It's important to lock up your cannabis, prescription medications, wine, beer, alcohol in your home to prevent youth access. Lock it up, talk it up. And finally, although there are a number of incidences of students being intoxicated with cannabis, not a single one of them was traced back to a dispensary while two-thirds of all cannabis sales occur on the black market. Thank you for listening. And Thank you for your comments. Hi, my name's Annette Olson, and I'm a Santa Cruz High School parent. 
Um, I've been really impressed with the presentation from um, Mr. Berryessa. It sounds like he runs a really reputable business. And obviously, the WAM supporters are very passionate about the service that Valerie has provided. And I very much respect all of that. Um, I'm not concerned that kids are going to be buying cannabis at the outlet. Um, what I'm concerned about is the proximity. Um, there is research that shows that when there are more outlets in proximity to young adults, they, their monthly use increases. And also, if there's signage associated with it, that um, their daily use goes up four to six times. So that's, I think, just the principle of advertising. If um, kids see stuff, they're going to want it. It's why tobacco isn't allowed to advertise around schools. So I just hope the well-being of um, our kids are not secondary to the well-being of WAM. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Hello, my name is Terry Sardinas. One of the most significant contributions of WAM is their role in helping patients reduce their, their um, reliance on harmful pharmaceuticals. As we all are too aware of the opioid ep epidemic has ravaged our community, and Santa Cruz is no exception. WAM offers a safe alternative to these addictive and potentially lethal medications, providing patients with natural and effective option for pain management and symptom relief. The real danger to the community are prescription pills and fentanyl, not cannabis. Moreover, WAM places a strong emphasis on safety and compliance with community rules and regulations, and they have implemented rigorous protocols to ensure the safety and security of their operations. Um, I have no doubt they would continue to uphold these standards if granted approval to open a dispensary. Unfortunately, I understand there must be a position from some members of the community based on outdated stigmas and fears surrounding cannabis. However, I urge you to consider overwhelming evidence of WAM's positive impact and the numerous testimonials from patients whose lives have been transformed by their services. By approving this, the establishment of a WAM dispensary, the City Council has an opportunity to prioritize the health and well-being of, our, of a respected organization that has been serving our community for nearly three decades. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. My name is Mindy White. I'm a physician. I prescribe medical, uh, well, I'm totally pro uh, recreational use for adults. I prescribe or recommend um, marijuana for patients for sleep, PTSD, anxiety all the time. Uh, I think having a marijuana dispensary next to the high school is um, super dangerous. There is an epidemic of anxiety and depression uh, in our teenagers, their brains uh, are so still traumatized from the pandemic when they were not in school. They do not know how to deal with these emotions. E marijuana is such an, it's so available. I'm not worried about them buying it at the, at the dispensary, but I am worried about them walking by that green sign every single day. It's all around them. The more they see it, the more they're going to um, be tempted. That's, you know, suggestive advertising works. And um, I am worried about them. They, this Santa Cruz High and Mission Hill kids walk to and from school every day. Um, it's a problem. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mm -hmm. Oh, welcome. Sheriff says it's okay. Way of us. Yeah, maybe. I can hear you. Okay. Would you reset the timer, please? <laughs> Does this work? Good. Yep. The sheriff says it's okay. Way of beauty in the community. Uh, and as far as vapes are concerned, uh, I'm concerned about them as well. And I think that's why raising the age is such an important thing. I also feel that families need to be more uh, having conversations about those specifically. If they're used incorrectly, it can burn the throat 
and you know they're uh, not all going to know that. So, thank you. How old were you when you first became a WAM member? Oh God, I was uh, twenty. So. Thank you for your comments. Hello folks, my name is Mike. I come to you as a father of three kids in the county, ages eight, 10, and 12. Um, I want to say that my kids going into middle school and high school, my immediate concerns are how is the administration working towards the 504 plan that my son has that the elementary schools have not been able to help? How are the schools working towards bullying and communication and creating kind, compassionate members of the community just within schools? Aside from that, I am concerned with party drugs, I'm concerned with Molly, I'm concerned with fentanyl, I'm concerned with cocaine, I'm concerned with the THCA hemps that are in stores for any 18 year old to buy. That is my concerns, cannabis is the least of my concerns, and I hope that the school board realizes that education and empowering students is what's going to help people make up their own minds rather than be seduced or whatever it is that we're concerned with, with cannabinoids. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Well, my name is Aaron Romanowski. I'm a professor of astrophysics. I'm not an expert in any of these matters, except I am an expert on data analysis and evidence. I have to say, I found her very contradictory stories about the evidence and the data on the youth trends and the effects of marijuana, big red flags and fishy looking plots. I thought so. It's also very fishy looking polished plots. Um, but if we did follow the evidence of the uh, business proposal, or the, the logic of it, the, the dispensaries are not only neutral for our youth, but they actually have positive benefits, then we should open one on every street corner around the schools. So obviously, there is a 600-foot default buffer for a reason. It's a default because local authorities are authorized to increase or decrease that. That's part of the matter here of, of what is uh, appropriate for our area. I'm also the father of two kids at Santa Cruz High School. My daughter used to go to Emily's all the time at lunch. It were a big loss to lose one of the very few healthy eating establishments within walking distance of the school. I thought it was uh, nuts to hear that there was gonna be a cannabis dispensary there instead. And um, I'd say, I'll just close to say, uh, what are the, uh, no one has presented the, what is the harm done? Uh, what is the loss of access to, uh, to the medical uh, needs by not having this one versus the, the risk to the youth? Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Hi, thank you. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you for being here this evening. You're doing a really good job. I know how hard it is. I'm Emily Riley, and I'm, um, I guess I'm not the Emily anymore, but I'm still Emily. And I want to say with just 100% support for what Bryce and, and Valerie are planning to do at 1129. It's been weird for me seeing that address up there all night going, wait a minute, what? what? It's not me anymore. Um, but uh, I'm, you know, when Bryce first approached me, he'd been a customer at the bakery since he was a little boy. And he told me, started to talk to me about what he wanted to do there uh, if, if he were in fact able to buy it and went through a lot of research and regulation and working with the landlord and, and finding out uh, that he would indeed be able to do it before he ever offered to purchase my business from me. And, and then, uh, then when he told me that he was working with Valerie, it just spoke to my heart. I've known Valerie for 30 years, worked with her as the mayor and when I was on the city council, and I can't say any more positively how much in support I am of what they're trying to do. Thanks. Thank you so much for coming. Hey, Shauna Eggling here. And um, I've been, I have worked with the mentally ill, both children and adults. 
I am a parent and grandparent, and I've worked with children as a teacher and a substitute teacher. I've had the occasion to read people's records, and what I'm finding or what I have found in the past, a lot of the behavior that's expressed in the children a lot of it, and I'm a parent, so I'm not blaming parents, but sometimes we're not that skillful. And quite a few different kinds of abuses or disrespect happens. Then it seems to me the kids try to um, self-medicate with alcohol, um, with bullying, and with marijuana. When I first went, they interviewed me asked me why I was there and told me which plants I would need. Talk about specific. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> hello. My name is Richard Vale. First, thank you very much for your hard work and all that you do. I think these issues, I've learned a lot here. I believe they are very important, especially with children. I don't believe anyone with the dispensary or WHAM in any way would try to advocate any kind of drug for a child, ever. Um, I have uh, known WHAM since about <clears throat> 2007. Um, Valerie knows of some injuries that I suffered on my ankle. I'm wearing, I, tell you something, I do, uh, do WHAM CBD. I got my hip replaced on Monday, and I'm standing here. <laughs> um, it, 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 I hesitated to even like hint at this, but there was an event in 2006 in Ben Lomond um, that she's not even aware of, and the support that she's given me through the years has been pivotal for me to stand here right now and speak to you as a totally loving human being of all life and all people. There was a very, very dark period. And she has no idea about it at all. That's the kind of person that she is. And she would visit people in the hospital when they're sick. I help with the peer-to-peer -peer with a lot of the people at cancer, um, mothers with their children that had seizures. Um, it's amazing the work that she does. But there's actually two issues. There's the dispensary and WHAM and the school. And that's important to, to distinction because I think we have a good dispensary and there is possibly a problem with IDs but I wonder also what's the penalty for someone who uses a false ID in a dispensary okay is so there I'm going to ask you to conclude your comments and that's very good I'm very thank you very much for your time thank you for coming congratulations on the hip <laughs> hello everybody my name is Bailey, and it is an absolute honor to be here, standing here as the marketing director for The Hook. Um, I have the privilege of working alongside such an amazing group of individuals and our uh, new wonderful esteemed partners of WAM, holding up the legacy of Valerie Corral. At The Hook, we pride ourselves on our squeaky clean track record for compliance. Ensuring that we operate within the legal and ethical guidelines is paramount to us. When it comes to marketing, we tread carefully to ensure our messages reach the right audience. Our website content is safeguarded behind a 21 and over age gate portal, a testament to our dedication to responsible communication. In line with the Department of Cannabis Control's regulations, we adhere strictly to the guidelines to ensure that 71.6% of our audience is over the age of 21 when advertising. Our marketing efforts are intentional avoiding engagement with underage demographics. Our journey at The Hook is about creating meaningful connections, celebrating life, and ensuring safety and compliance in everything we do. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, <clears throat> hi, Pat Malo. I was uh, born and raised in Santa Cruz. I've had the uh, pleasure of going through this regulatory process with a lot of you all um, over the last you know decade. I've also had the pleasure and heartache really of being a WAM board member and member through the last decade. Um, <clears throat> and what really is, strikes me today is that you know Bryce, uh, Valerie, myself, and many other people in the room have been involved with youth prevention for going on a decade now with the CPP group that um, <clears throat> 
you know, has been focused around these issues and database driven public health graphs like you saw on the thing. And really what we found is, you know, legal dispensaries are not where children are getting medicine, they're getting it at home for the most part. And so there's really, that's where the talk it up, lock it up, data driven approach came from. And second, since we just have a minute, is that I know this is going to get through and they're going to be able to open up, but if some way they don't, I'm counting on everyone in the room to put as much effort into finding WAM, a new spot to be able to do their work as they did into doing what we've done tonight. And because you don't know how bad you need WAM till you need them, and that's not the time to be working towards these things. So we're all privileged not to need a WAM, but I know people who need a WAM mm -hmm. and... Thank you for your comments. Hi there. Um, my name is Fiona Pierce, and I am a student at Santa Cruz High School. And I don't agree with the dispensary location. It's maybe a four, three if you're walking fast. Walk during break. So you could be there and back within the 10-minute passing period that I have. Um, in the realm of fake IDs, I know several people that uh, have admitted to me that they've obtained a, a medical card just because they wanted one. Um, and <laughs> as a teenager myself, I know that the location will be taken advantage of. I know people, I know my peers, it's not gonna be good. Um, I've also spoken to a few of my teachers and they share my sentiment. Dealing with the people who will be under the influence of cannabis during class is not something they wanna do. And frankly, neither do I. I don't want my education to suffer because my peers take advantage of this location. I urge you to consider that thoroughly as you make your decision. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Good evening. My name is John Owen. I'm a trustee for the Santa Cruz City Schools. Um, I truly believe in the powerful work that Valerie has done and WAM is completing. That is extremely important to our community. Um, I do agree that Bryce um, and is, runs a probably a very good business that's conscientious. However, what nobody has addressed in this whole discussion is why it is so imperative that that cannabis dispensary be located so close to, a, to two schools and putting kids at risk for all the reasons that have been stated. The statistics that have been used have not been stated correctly. There's much evidence of the, of the abuse of cannabis in our schools and THC, I urge you to consider to amend the ordinance for how far away a cannabis dispensary can be from a school. That's what's at issue. Thank you for your comments. Hello, my name is Kyle Drakino, and I am uh, the founder of Treehouse and also the Hook Outlet with Bryce Berryessa. Um, in lieu of only a minute, I will shorten what I had to say. Um, I ask you to consider the bigger picture here. The opposition to our dispensary is rooted in the same old, tired, failed rhetoric of the, drug, uh, the war on drugs. It's a narrative that has wrought untold damage to our communities of color, torn families apart, and squandered countless resources in our communities. By approving our dispensary, you have the opportunity to turn the page on this shameful part of our history and embrace a more just and compassionate, evidence-based approach. In conclusion, I urge you to see our dispensary for what it truly is. Not a threat, but a promise. A promise to a safer community where medicine is accessible, jobs are created, and the harms of prohibition are healed. The choice before you, to me, is clear. You can cling to the fears of the past, or you can step boldly into the future. I know which I would choose, and I trust you'll make the right choice as well. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Hi, I'm Tatum. I live across the street from this dispensary. Uh, I just want to bring to light some issues that we've had in the last 10 years that I've been there. Uh, there's an alleyway right behind where I'm constantly kicking out students for smoking weed. They trash it. It's not a great situation. Um, and it's just not the right place. I've worked in the industry. I'm a full supporter of cannabis. Um, but this is not the location that it should be at. Uh, my family's lived on the street for 80 years. And it's just a shame what it's coming to. Thank you for your comments. Hello. Um, 
My name is Steve Sykes. I'm the father of a junior at Santa Cruz High and a sixth grader at Mission Hill Middle School. And I want to thank those schools in the Santa Cruz City Schools District and the County Office of Education for their strong opposition to a potential marijuana dispensary at uh, 1129 Mission Street. Uh, this location is on a main corridor of Santa Cruz where hundreds of students walk, bike, skate uh, on a daily basis to and from their schools. Um, and uh, as, as, previous, as previously mentioned, tonight I ask you, the Planning Commission, to uh, join our educational institutions in taking the same oppositional stance to glamorizing marijuana use for our underage community. Um, I think our job as a community is to stand in the gap for our youth, regardless of their gender, their race, their age. And uh, as I walk and drive through Santa Cruz, um, it offers constant reminders to me of the devastation that drug use leaves behind. And so there, there are only victims in its wake. Um, all government and civic organizations should be ready to take up the cause of protecting the innocent and well-being of the youngest um, members of our community. Please deny this opportunity, um, the dispensary, the opportunity to place their business and products in a location so close to our schools. If you remember two words tonight, uh, I hope you remember location and advocacy. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Hello, my name is Zach Von Worley. I'm the student trustee for Santa Cruz High, and I'm speaking just as a senior for, or at Santa Cruz High. I would like to start by saying I'm a moderate on this subject, and I did vote against this dispensary in our recent school board meeting, because I, will, I do believe it will bring more cannabis into our schools, which is not good. But I will say, and in saying that, fake IDs do exist, and they are usable at dispensaries. And I've seen it firsthand. But the issue of pot in our schools won't be curbed by undermining a legal business who took the required steps. Additionally, Brian's offer to limit under 19 medical users access to this dispensary seems very realistic and effective in stopping high school users going to it. I would like to encourage him to donate to our arts uh, s sectors at Santa Cruz City Schools. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I'm not the only one. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Brock and I've uh, worked with and for WAM um, throughout the years and there's been a mention of um, balancing of harms and I, I think that the patients who came up here today really speak to the possible harm of uh, this location not opening up. And it, for those who don't know the background, um, it feels very easy to say, well, just put it somewhere else. Um, but we, we saw the map, and that, actually, that map is actually an overrepresentation because it doesn't include the 600 feet from any other cannabis, um, uh, current cannabis location. And um, so I, I really want to urge the council to, to balance the harms uh, while respecting the concerns of um, the, the, the parents here. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Hello, my name is Josh, and uh, I'm here to support the Hook Outlet. And I uh, just wanted you guys to realize that we have, like, veterans in the back that are uh, amazing veterans, superheroes that are here right now. And uh, I just want to thank you guys for, for thinking and, and really like uh, considering all everything here. I grew up around Narcotics Anonymous, uh, so that's kind of my background. Uh, but today I get to kind of help keep the high schoolers out of trouble. So I perform at like high school grad nights and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I just hope you guys uh, make the right choice. I think that uh, zoning was already like decided. So I think we just need to, need to kind of keep going with that. Um, and thank you guys for your time. Thank you for your comments. You certainly may. Paul Thank Howard, you for your patience. You all are great, and I, I believe, so I've never smoked, and I never will. What am I doing here? I'm in the middle. Oddly, I'm in the middle of everybody here, and I've heard everything, and I think this gentleman and that gentleman hit on the answer. You asked how much is there in the fund from the tax, 800000 I recommend it's a win-win-win. Let the dispensary be there, use some of the fundage from the tax, and cure all the problems that are a concern. Uh, parents are worried about their kids going to the dispenser. I know for a fact, I've been to the dispensers with the people that I care for. No kid is going to get by at lunchtime or recess or whatever, buying from the dispensary. I know that for a fact. I've been in them. It's not going to happen. We heard about all the securities they have in place. 
not going to happen. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. Thank you very much for your comments. Are there any other speakers? Father of a middle schooler and a high schooler. Um, so marijuana. Yeah. Am I too close? No, no. Okay. So marijuana has had a tragic effect on my family, and I don't want to go into the details. But what I do want to say is that um, I think there's been a lot of focus on the fact that they're going to check IDs. I think the problem actually is is that the transitive sale of marijuana. So, for example, there are lots of people in this town who will buy marijuana and resell it or buy marijuana products. And so at the time I first learned about the hook was when I confiscated a product from this gentleman's store from my son. Um, so I know for a fact that, uh, that, they, that, that dispensaries do introduce marijuana into the community. Um, and I, I know they, they say that there's no evidence that that happens, but this goes against the lived experience of every single parent of a teenager in this town. I also want to say that um, they've talked a lot about checking ID, but if the prospective dispensary owner has no plan for how they're going to prevent pe people from reselling drugs to other children, effectively what they actually have is a plan to sell drugs to children. So I would like to leave with that. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else who would like to address the commission this evening? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Um, at this time, we generally take, give staff the opportunity um, to respond to any comments that were made that they think leave a hanging chad. I was just going to mention, <clears throat> I know in the past we've allowed the applicant mm -hmm. to have a rebuttal if he wanted yep. to. Mm -hmm. No, nope, I was going to do so that next. I don't have anything <laughs> to say. Do you have anything to say? No. Okay. All right, uh, and uh, please go ahead. Okay, um, I'm going to do something is, unconventional clear, for a second. Um, we very typically ask the applicant if they would like to respond to any comments made through public comment, and that's what we're doing right now. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, to every parent in the room, I have the same concerns you do. The things that keep me up at night the most are thinking about how technology, social media, and substances are going to affect my kids as they grow up. I am an ally in that, whether you want me to open or not. And if you want to have a conversation of how we can make our community safer, whether you are for this dispensary or whether you are against it, please come talk to me. My door is open. I have my email listed. I'm all over social media lately trying to spread awareness about this project. And just know that I'm here for you and we're in this together, whether you believe in cannabis or not. So I, I don't fault you for being here because as parents, we're doing what we can to be the best that we can for our kids. So. Um, as far as public comment goes, this isn't a referendum on cannabis. The decision being made isn't whether cannabis is appropriate or whether our kids should use it or not. The decision being made tonight is based off of current established law, zoning, and guidelines. As an entrepreneur in this community, I made a commitment in good faith that if I abided by the city's laws, I did what the city asked of me, and I followed the restrictions, I would get an entitlement to operate. I've invested all of the financial uh, accumulation that my partner and I have made since we have opened the hook into this project. There is no other location for us. We can't get a loan. We don't have investors. There no, there's no special interest. It's the two of us and Val. And I didn't do this to make money. I didn't do this to you know, expand my empire. I did it to support an organization that I love and that I owe everything to. And every single person in this industry owes everything they have or a part of it to this woman right here and her partner that founded WAM. And so for me, I'm fighting so hard because this is a legacy. I want to help carry it on because it's important to me. And I would have never chosen that location. And when we, Kyle and I are pessimistic. We look at things from worst case scenario as we're making decisions because we're constantly dealing with issues. I never thought in a million years that we would have the community opposition that we have. We wouldn't have chosen Emily's if we would have known that it would have been so frustrating to the community. We can't turn back. I'm sorry, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Chris, I'm sorry, you know, I understand you guys are concerned. I can't turn back. I don't have the resources. And I will work with you, and I will do everything I possibly can. 
to minimize our impact and to do whatever we can to collaborate. The school board didn't reach out to us before they made the resolution. I will reach out to every member of the school board tomorrow and sit down and talk with you. And let's figure out how we can make this work in the best way possible if we're able to open. And if we aren't, I'm still a parent in the community. So let's figure out how to make our community safer together. Thank you. Thank you for your final comments. All right. Um, thank you uh, very much to everybody for speaking. And um, with that, uh, this matter will return to the commission for deliberation. <laughs> we'll be deliberating until we're done. Five uh, seconds. Yeah. <laughs> so, Tonight at some um, point, though. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. We, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. We will be doing it before we leave tonight. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So with that, um, we'll we'll uh, stop public intercourse and discuss up here as our bylaws state we will. Would anybody care to begin? Of course you can. Yes. Commissioner Gordon has a question. Are you asking a question? Yeah, of the, I am asking oh. a question of people that are here. Um, can I get a raise of hands of how many people participated in the zoning, the original zoning conversation about um, the boundaries and, and um, the medical marijuana or marijuana dispensary locations? Anybody from the school board? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have one qu uh, quick question. Is it a maximum of four in the city? Is that what we established? It's five. Five, five. okay. There's, no, there's how many now? Four. This is the last one, okay. And this will be five. And this will be the last one. So I was here during that process. It was one of the greatest things that I ever did serving up here was legalizing weed. It was fantastic. <laughs> And um, that was seven years ago. I had just had my boy. Now he's in second grade at Bayview. So I would say that my perspective on this has not changed, and it has evolved quite a lot. Um, but I just feel all sides of this. I mean, I, my, my high school algebra teacher is here, you know, good friend, uh, the, my kid's soccer coach from two years ago, a lot of familiar uh, faces that I see, the school board who I work with a lot. So um, I just go back to consistency and the balancing we did throughout that process. Ryan, can you put that map back up with the little green dots, you know, sprinkled through? And everyone knows this map. The reason we pick 600 feet is because if you go any further, you will, in fact, be eliminating marijuana clubs from Santa Cruz. You know, a lot of people said, why not 1,000 feet? Or, you know, I'm just throwing out numbers, or 450 or 200. Like, where's the line? And we did this intentionally, not just me, as a community, as a process, because we felt it was important to make medicine available to people, acknowledging that there's risk, you know, to kids and all that kind of stuff. And, and this is the balance. So um, I don't think we should adjust that boundary that's been set. I think this project meets that. Like all uses, there's going to be an impact, and we mitigate, mitigate those as best we can with conditions. In my experience with the existing clubs, as a consumer and just like a neighbor and cruising by them with my kids, they seem fine you know, to me. So that's been my experience. Um, I want to look at that map one more time. And if you put the 600 feet around three rows, kind peoples, you know, the other ones, there's really nowhere left. If you were to be a business owner and get so lucky as to like find one in that little green dot over there on the other side of town, you're gonna to be close to another school. Our town is just so small that you're gonna be close to a school wherever you go. So though I have concern about the impacts, I think that starts in the home and education. Um, I, you know, just my opinion on legal weed doesn't matter. These are the planning standards we've set out a lot of work and I want to stick to them tonight and approve this project that's uh, where I'm at with it thank you sure. Commissioner Dan 
Thank you. Um, I appreciate Commissioner Kennedy's comments, and I'd like to align myself with what you said. Um, I also um, am deeply, have been deeply involved at the county in drafting uh, the county's um, cannabis dispensary ordinance and uh, cultivation ordinance. And um, uh, so I, I also uh, remember when the city was drafting theirs in 2017. And uh, this, um, excuse me, I have to put my glasses on. I can't read what I've written. <clears throat> And so I'm going by really what the code says, which was uh, heavily debated in public, um, was iterated, and, um, and this business has uh, come in and is not only in conformance with the existing ordinance, but he has exceeded those standards. And I don't think that it's our role in government to move the goalpost after the fact. I think that's bad government. And I also looked at deeply at the findings because those are very important in making this decision. The staff provided findings of denial and findings for approval. And I read those deeply and thoroughly. And honestly, the findings for denial just simply don't, are not credible. And the findings for approval are very, very strong. And the reason for that is because this application is in full conformance with our ordinance, so it's easy to make the findings when that's the case. Uh, so I also will be supporting this application, and um, I am, I'm also want to say I'm a neighbor. Um, my daughter also went to Mission Hill in Santa Cruz High. I live a stone's throw, literally, from the campus. Um, my garage also abuts the alley that came up. Um, I, uh, and so I, this is in my neighborhood. This is my neck of the woods, and um, I um, am going to be in support of this application. Okay, thank you. Any other commissioners caring to make a comment? Commissioner Polhamus. Thank you to the chair. Um, so I'm going to try to get through my laundry list of comments, and hopefully I still have a job tomorrow. Um, okay, so... Um, I just want to say first thank you to everybody that came out to um, you know give public comment on this uh, issue. Just wanted to say a few things. Um, you know, as uh, Mr. Barrias has said, this is not a referendum on cannabis. Um, but really quickly, I'm just going to go over some thoughts that I wrote down. Um, you know, the industry is a socially beneficial, well-regulated, and in some ways overregulated, in my opinion, and uh, legitimate. The employees are competent, hardworking, upstanding, ethical, contributing members of the community, and the applicant has made a good faith effort to address community concerns. The WAM partnership is incredibly attractive. Um, they have a great record as responsible, conscious, community-oriented merchants. They've gone above and beyond to make this work, and they also have a strong endorsement from John Leopold, which is somebody that I uh, deeply respect. And uh, full disclosure, um, one of my best friends growing up is the CEO of Canadips, which is a nationally distributed product. Um, and other friends from high school were uh, cannabis capitalists, so to speak, and got in with uh, legalization pretty early. So I'm a little bit more familiar with uh, this industry than maybe some others. Um, so a couple comments just on this. I don't believe that cannabis dispensaries are selling to underage, ki underage kids as a primary issue. I think it's mostly community members that are proliferating product that is purchased legally. So we're talking about friends, um, siblings, and unfortunately, parents um, in some cases. And there is no way to regulate the end user. And um, I believe that this is primarily the way that this is um, getting into kids' hands. And as everybody has recognized, this is a public uh, issue in our, in our schools. Um, dispensaries are linked to uh, proliferation of product into nearby geographies that is supported by several different studies. Um, one a particular RAND study that says a higher number of licensed marijuana outlets within four miles of one's home was significantly associated with a greater likelihood of past month marijuana use. And at the end of the day for me, um, as a public school teacher, as a person who's been involved with youth for a very, very long time, who's very familiar with the culture, with networks of distribution in black markets and also the legal cannabis market, um, there is no way to reconcile that this is a block away from Santa Cruz High School. 
There just isn't. Um, cannabis use is completely normalized in this state and in pretty much, you know, Santa Cruz, it's really normalized. If we were just talking about legalizing or permitting cannabis flower, I would have absolutely no issue with that. That is not what kids are using today. Okay. They are using incredibly concentrated, concealable, and I'm sorry to say, very difficult to trace products. Okay. So for the boomers in the room, what you smoked, probably two to 4%. What my age group smoked, probably a little bit more than that, 10 to 15%. What kids are able to get today in terms of THC is anywhere between, at least at the higher end, 80 to 95% pure. Okay. So it is not just the regular flower stuff that we're talking about here. Okay. For me, it's the location, the pro proliferation of the product and the potency of the product that is available really, really close to Santa Cruz High School. Now, other issues that have nothing to do with this are pandemic learning loss, which, I mean, the superintendent of the county schools just sent out a huge newsletter about major drops in math, in reading, in truancy, and also mental health issues. Um, there was a, a comparison of Kirby, and um, I believe it's Canna Cruz that's over there. That is 125 kids, and it costs 50K a year. Okay, that's a much smaller population that we're dealing with. And, um, you know, kids aren't walking around in the Costco neighborhood. They're just not. Um, Santa Cruz High School has 1,200 kids. And so we're talking about a much larger population of our youth. Um, personally, I think Mr. Barry, Mr. Barry Essa is exactly the type of merchant that we want to have in this community for this particular type of product. Um, I would approve it right next door to my house. I am not going to support a motion for approval right next to Santa Cruz High School. I'm just not. Uh, the proposed, according to zoning section code section 24.12.1350, it states that the proposed use will not adversely affect the health, safety, or welfare of area residents, businesses, or uses, will not result in an undue concentration of cannabis businesses in any one neighborhood or district, and will not be located within proximity of an incompatible use such as a children's school, daycare facility, or the youth center. And that is the law. That is what we passed in this county. Okay. I will not be supporting the application. It has absolutely nothing to do with Mr. Berryessa. He has made absolutely every effort to mitigate some of the negative impacts that this could cause, but you cannot control the end user and the proliferation of very, very potent product within the community once it is out the door. You just can't. So those would be my comments. Thank you for your comments. Commissioner McKelvey. This is a really hard question for me. I'm, I've been often on the other side as the applicant here, and I, I'm a, kind of a rules guy, and I really respect the process that creates the standards that we have in our community because I believe that everyone that works on them has the best interests of the community at heart. Um, I think there's a lot of thought that's gone into the re regulations as they sit. Um, it's just hard to have the goalpost move, as other people have said. Having said that, I feel like the evidence that I've read, both in the staff, the documentation for the for the uh, hearing, um, I did a little reading on my own. Um, I feel that that's compelling, and that the most difficult aspect of this project, and that is close proximity to educational, you know, youth facilities, you can't mitigate it. It's, it is what it is, and uh, we've developed a rule about it. Um, and it's obvious to me that every single person that's spoken here tonight, uh, here and uh, in the in the public side, you are very sincere. You are. We're all very interested in getting the best possible outcome. Um, I'd like to ask if there is any precedent or a mechanism within the, con or an additional condition of approval that I know that's anathema, but uh, is there something we can say that, you know, the, the, the applicant speaks with incredible conviction about there not being any problems. I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, that's one of the reasons I asked about the experiences that, that they've had. Um, can we have a very stringent expectation about anything that might happen? Can we say that, 
you know, is it is it a given that we have to have the same response to violations or or failures vis-a-vis -vis the conditions of approval uh, that they have to be the exact same uh, process for any applicant with any project? Uh, in other words, can we can we have stricter um, requirements for the performance in satisfying the conditions of approval? Do you have something specific in mind? I don't know. I was asking about the, the frequency be, of of. Uh, it would have to be pretty concrete and. Specific. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, is <laughs> I hate to be, say, sorry. So I've been on this commission many years ago mm -hmm. when we had alcohol permits <laughs> where certain bars and stuff had, frankly, horrifying things going on, and I could not come up with that condition right now. But we could maybe research it before mm -hmm. council, and it was. Um, yeah, it was more stringent on the folks who'd blown it three times. That's blown it I'm thinking, police. you know, I hate to say it, three strikes. I, I'm you know, all that, that stuff right come, it yeah, conjures all the inequities and everything. Done it but, okay. And, and it's so use, yeah, so I'm, drug I'm open to ideas about it, but I, I think it's worth suggesting that people have a right to keep an eye on this if it's approved and that there has to be very, very straightforward... Uh, consequences I don't know are you talking about permit revocation I believe right so maybe if you're looking for additional uh, probation conditions. for you know I or or you know three times within 12 months or something that would be reasonable you know it's a huge investment that the, that the applicant is making here and I don't want to disrespect that I'm just saying that the concerns that have been raised are very reasonable and they're 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 not it's it's not just apocryphal. It's it's a it's something that happens, and um, I I just wonder if there's a way that we can acknowledge that in the conditions of approval, or and I'm open to discussion or suggestion. But if if that's something that people wouldn't support, then well, let's let's um, at this point in time, we're, this it's the commission deliberation. Uh, thank you, um, Commissioner Thompson. Did you have something to add? Uh, I'm. Um, uh, I'm going to weigh in here. I, I, uh, the n notion that the 600 square foot or 600 uh, uh, foot distance um, was uh, carefully discussed and was the result of um, uh, a, a compromise that uh, was thought to be appropriate and effective. And I haven't uh, heard anything this evening that uh, would have me wanting to go out and change the rule. Um, uh, the part, though, that really um, makes me more comfortable about supporting this project is that um, I, I walk for exercise, and this is basically my neighborhood. And so I'm out walking a lot of times when uh, both schools are, are, are emptying out. And um, uh, I see how much moving around they do on their electric bikes and on uh, every kind of way of getting around. Um, the notion that, um, that if you went to 1,200 feet, that would change anything, I think is just crazy. Um, uh, uh, the, the, they can get where they want to go really fast, and there's lots of them. Um, so um, my, my sense is that um, the city actually did a good job of saying we shouldn't have them too close to schools and thought through a number of measurements, how, how, what, how long is that going to be, um, came up with a decision and the applicant relied on the fact that the city had actually said there's a number. And uh, based on the city being specific about what that distance was, made a big investment. And I haven't seen anything or heard anything this evening to suggest that there would be a different remedy um, that would be appropriate at this point. Um, this is kind of the question's been asked and answered. It's time for us to um, uh, just uh, kind of take this as grown-ups as, as we're supposed to be and say we've, we've got a rule and, um, and they've met it. And, and just to Wait. clarify, I'm not talking about changing the metric. I'm just talking about 
how what the shape of the approval is. Yeah. Okay, thank you for your comments. Um, yes, I, I thought I'd add here. Um, there's in the municipal code. There's already a pretty strict section for violations and abatement. It's uh, section twenty four point one two point thirteen seventy. And it says that the zoning administrator may issue a cease and desist order or stop order for all activities subject to the administrative use permit for any establishment deemed by the zoning administrator to be in violation of any condition of approval of the administrative use permit or otherwise to constitute a public nuisance. The stop order shall be in effect immediately pursuant to the specific procedures. Upon the issuance of the stop order, the zoning administrator shall schedule a public hearing to consider the revocation of the administrative use permit. So it's kind of baked into the code uh, that there is a stop order general, process. But yes, I understand that. That's why I asked the question. Is it? OK, thank so. you. And Commissioner Gordon. Um, I was wondering if we could hear from the Santa Cruz police officer that's here, um, who I'm guessing has a lot of information that a couple people up here are looking for in regards to um, information that you have about the four dispensaries that are operating here and calls um, or things that you've experienced that you could share with us. Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Carter Jones. I'm a lieutenant with the Santa Cruz Police Department. I oversee community services. I also, for the purposes of this, um, this planning commission meeting, it's important to understand I also oversee entertainment permits um, and I have physically gone into every single active marijuana dispensary in the last week to check on security protocols regarding to, you know, as we talk about IDs and, and how often uh, we go there. Um, as mentioned in Mr. Bain's report, um, we have not had a single call for service at any one of the dispensaries for fake IDs in the last four years. There's all the reports for that. Um, that just goes to the effect of we've talked in depth about security measures, about um, you know multiple ID verification systems. Uh, that's a state law above and beyond anything that you can comprehend with going into a bar and just having someone look at your ID and serving you a drink. Um, so to just kind of put it into perspective, when someone goes into a dispensary, um, in most of these dispensaries, you walk into a room or an area that you you are granted access just to that area until you get verified, and then you get moved into a second area um, for actually looking at any of the products on display. And that's after your ID is verified or after your medical marijuana card is verified and then secondarily checked on a website. Um, so this isn't just a matter of like, oh, yeah, you've got a fake ID that some bouncers going to look at at the front door. So there's multiple verification processes that are that are state law. Um, so most of everything that the research I done I did was asked for by the planning department uh, and put into their report. Um, but just a little bit further on those security measures and, and things of that nature. If there's any other specific questions, happy to field those as well. Thank you for that question and thanks for the answer. Yeah. Oh, Good hang on. Of course it is. Uh, I went to Santa Cruz. I was thinking of Officer Black used to sit with his radar gun on Bay Street. Like, I still think of that man with speed because he's <laughs> terrifying to us. So I'm uh, very sympathetic to your staffing. I'm not saying an officer should sit in front of this spot every day, but, like, do you patrol? I mean, it sounds like you're going in there every week anyway. Do you patrol more? Do you, how do you um, reassure the community that PD's on watching their kids uh, as best you can? We have school resource officers. We um, we patrol as much as we can when we're not running call to call all around the city. So, um, and we we progressively go to places where we get more calls for service. Um, okay. That's, okay. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, oh, never mind. Has any, have they ever like you could do an assessment district? We could all tax ourselves to pay for this kind of extra thing. You know, if we wanted more patrols. So I should just stop talking now. <laughs> uh, thank you for being on top of this stuff. I appreciate it. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, were you were you done, Commissioner Gordon? I'm done. Okay. <laughs> okay, I have a comment or two also. Um, so first of all, I 
strongly agree um, with the problems of cannabis and kids. And in addition to those that were cited um, by the World Health Organization regarding brain development and mental health, I just worry about how vulnerable it makes them. And I wish there were a way to stop every single kid from vaping, because I know it's going to be really hard for them to stop. Um, but I'm unconvinced um, also by arguments against this site. Um, exposure normalizes. I think it's too late for that. Um, and there's a lot of reasons to be concerned about kids and cannabis, but nothing I've heard leads me to believe that this location will exacerbate or contribute to more kids getting their hands on cannabis. Um, this community has a long history of supporting legal access to cannabis, and we already made the rules. Um, there are not a lot of potential sites, um, and I don't buy that argument for affordable housing projects when they come up, but it is especially true of a cannabis site. There are so many rules and so many limitations. Um, it was <laughs> barely mentioned tonight, but they can't get loans from a bank. They can't use banks. Um, which means that they are really limited. They're not the cash cows that we all hoped they would be into the city and county treasury. I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> um, and we're not in Monterey County. Uh, we're in Santa Cruz, and the Santa Cruz city rules apply. Um, and the time to change the rules is not now. Um, when we have an applicant investing in our community based on the rules that we set some time ago. Um, finally, um, the rules apply to projects that have, ha that have submitted applications, not the businesses people wish for. Um, there were a lot of good ideas of what would be nice on that corner, and none of those applications are before the commission tonight. So the horse left the barn. Um, there's no use closing the bar barn door now. Um, I do think it's a good time to build some good, safe fences and fortify them as needed. And um, we've heard about this group being a solid citizen. I'm glad to hear that. Um, and I guess I also just think it would be flat out unfair to stop this project. And it would be a loss to the community. Um, so anybody have any further comments wanting to make any specific changes to the conditions of approval or the find findings? And oh, I just want to say thank you to, there's a lot of work. I mean, we see a lot of projects come across the, here, and a ton of effort has been made on all of the passionate people's sides, including, I know the city, you know, has, has to <laughs> assemble all of this. So I just want to say thank you, and, um, and I share the sentiments of all the things that you've said. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I agree with that. I um, really thank everybody for their participation and for caring so much. We would make a motion to uh, approve the project with conditions. I'd second that. Any further discussion? Um, I'd just like to thank the staff, Ryan, for your staff report. I thought it was really well done and very thorough, and I neglected to thank you for that. OK. Any other I comments? keep thinking about just like money going directly to these schools, but then I just feel like that's unfair to burden this business. And his kids are going there, so he'll probably be donating anyway, I would imagine. <laughs> so I'll just withdraw that. But I want to say. <laughs> Thank like, you for your constant pressure, yeah. too. But with all, I, yeah. It's hard. And I'm going to the fundraising so you know, auction it happens tomorrow. Every time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of booze. Right about the spot. OK. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. We have, we have a motion on the floor and a second. And uh, Further comment? Um, I, uh, Commissioner Thompson, you have some conditions. I have also some conditions I'd like to offer. I, you, I think he was moving I the don't staff think recommendation on the conditions. Oh, recommendation. with the conditions? Uh -huh. OK. Um, can I offer a friendly amendment for some conditions? Possibly. Right out. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, um, I sent you an email uh, with some conditions. That's me. I did. Should I send it to somebody else?
type those in or read them out or what would be I can read preferable? I mean, is it I, I think it might be more helpful for it? people to see them. Is it possible okay. to put them on screen? where I can get to them at the moment on here, but I certainly can type them up. I have access to my email here. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Mike, I often CC the clerks too, just so the emails like okay. any spots as it can be around this for sure. I just don't know her and I don't have her email. <laughs> just send it, I just sent it to you if you have it. You want to just read them out? Or, sorry, chair. Sure. It? I mean, while we're waiting so we can don't waste sure. time. Um, are we getting close? Okay, are we ready? Do you, do you have them, Mariana? Or? Oh, okay. Here, why don't I go ahead and... It's always so much fun to have everybody watching you type. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm so sorry, but... I gotta, I gotta offer these because this is a real, yeah. real problem at our site. Okay, thank you. Um, so, this location shall not possess, sell, or distribute any psychoactive THC product which meets any one or all of the following criteria. A THC potency of greater than 40%. This includes but is not limited to flour, concentrates, shatter, wax, dabs, oil, hash, pre-rolls or infused pre-rolls or other types of smokable products. B, an individual serving containing greater than 10 milligrams THC for an individual dosage or 100 total uh, within any given product. This includes but is not limited to edibles, cookies, gummies, candies, mints, lozenges, beans, tinctures, extracts, beverages, tablets, pills, capsules, chips, pa I think the last one is pouches or any other type of ingestible product. And then C, vaping products of any kind. This includes but is not limited to batteries, cartridges, pods, pens, disposables, or all-in-ones, wall chargers, USB chargers, or any type of vaping paraphernalia. Okay, um, this conversation is here at this point in time, however, so, in, unless um, a commission... So you're no. offering this as a friendly amendment? I am offering it as a friendly Thank amendment, them. and really quickly, just as a point of what this will do, is it stops more potent product, it stops the potent types of potent product that are really problematic, it stops the very large edible doses that makes kids pass out or otherwise have problems in class, and it eliminates vaping products. So, but I would oh, uh, just can I respond point, to that? as a point of order? Um, sure. So right now, what we have a uh, we have a motion and a second, mm -hmm. and you're asking for a friendly amendment. Correct. So at this point, we should, um, and I have, I have a ton of questions. <laughs> also, but we should see if the maker of the motion and the second are willing to accept a friendly amendment. I'm I'm not. Uh, this is uh, too much new information. I'm okay. not as well because of, frankly, what Commissioner Thompson said, which was an excellent point, that this will not stop the, that because um, there's other dispensaries that would not be subject to this condition of approval. And, you know, I, let me just say, you know, I, I don't think anybody in this room wants any young person to be ingesting any of these products. Vaping is, is the most horrible invention. And I would also say, you know, the kids um, uh, can get tobacco vapes at the gas stations that are far closer to um, the school than, than this dispensary will be. And that's where, that's where they hang out all the time. And 
I would love it if there was enforcement at those gas stations. Um, you know, I'm sure, you know, parents okay. with kids. Anyway, so enough said. I think All right. the comment that Commissioner Thompson said about uh, kids being very mobile is uh, apropos for this. And Commissioner Paul Hamas, thank you very much for your thoughtful, um, for your thinking on this. I know it's a really important issue. Mm -hmm. So we have a motion on the floor and a second. Uh, could we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Dan? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. McKelvey? No. Paul Hamas? No. Thompson? Yes. Conway? Yes. With that, the motion carries and the uh, project is approved. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank, thank you very much. And um, uh, our meeting is, is not yet done. So we'd appreciate it if you took your conversations outdoors. Yeah, we'd go outside. We'll be here for a few more minutes. You're and welcome to stay, but it's not very you are, Yeah, you're certainly welcome to stay. It just... I'm not time here. I got to do my four miles We'll just wait a minute. Um, uh, it's a um, uh, fun place to walk, frankly. I walk down King Street. Uh, the other thing we're going to take a two-minute recess while the room clears. Six hundred. Nothing. They can be at any dispensary that they want to be in fifteen minutes. No helmet. I have no shoes. I mean, I want to talk to you. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think we have like just a couple of things. Oh, okay, good. I didn't think we were in sure. No, we don't always have the same thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, I tried to. Down or are we waiting for people to go out? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, no oh, way, are you kidding me? No, 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 no. Okay. With that, I'm going to ask everyone to please leave the chambers. We will be picking up this. Can you guys take it outside so we can finish our meeting and go That's home right. to our own families too? Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your consideration of the long night. And uh, anyone is welcome to stay and listen to um, our ne the c conclusion of our meeting <laughs> quietly. All right. <clears throat> Almost there. If you're continue, if you're still in the room and continuing to talk, could you please at least uh, stop talking? <laughs> Finish your conversations out of the room. Thank you so much. <laughs> Me? <laughs> I regretted the one. I supported that. Yeah. Oh, counsel. <laughs> okay. Thank you, uh, everybody. And uh, moving right along, do we have any information items at, for tonight, Mr. Do. Butler. Thank you, Chair Conway. Um, just a few quick updates for you. Um, the commission considered the coastal permit for the oversized vehicle ordinance on uh, February 1st, I believe it was, that was appealed to the city council. And um, that um, will be heard by the council this coming Tuesday, the 12th of March um, and um, we are anticipating that will uh, also get appealed to the Coastal Commission 
Um, so the uh, assuming if there is a approval by the, the council, I should say, then um, there would also be an appeal to the Coastal Commission. Um, also coming up at the City Council on the uh, 26th. Were there big changes before Council? Like did anything change with that or was it pretty um, much the same thing? Thanks for that question. Uh, the, the staff report is actually posted now. Um, uh, we um, made some minor uh, updates. We met with the stakeholder group one additional time um, and we made some minor updates. The stakeholder group has also um, provided a uh, suggested list of additional conditions, and so we're going to be considering those and uh, may have some verbal updates. We just got that late last night, and the packet was posting today, so we didn't get a chance to incorporate responses related to that. But um, I only ask because that timeline was so close coming up to us. I wanted to make sure there was yes, yeah. The so yeah. we did okay. have a chance to meet with the stakeholder group one more time, and. Um, we do anticipate having some um, additional recommendations uh, after additional coordination with Santa Cruz Cares and ACLU and uh, disability rights advocates. So tune in on Tuesday. Um, then uh, this coming, uh, the, the March 26th meeting, um, there are a few things coming up. Um, our annual progress report to the state, to HCD, that has um, both our uh, RENA numbers, which as you all know, um, we did meet our RENA targets in every income category for the fifth cycle. So that was Good very job. exciting and we will be officially uh, transmitting that to the, uh, to the uh, HCD along with our general plan progress report. And um, we, um, once they acknowledge that, it will not be subject to um, SB 35 or the new version of SB 35 um, as of January 1 of next year, which is SB 423, um, for the next four years. Um, and the final, because we met our targets, we were able to count the final six months of last year towards um, this next cycle, which is a nice we little bonus. Start. Um, yes, we got a little head start, which is nice. Is there going to be a party? <laughs> it's City Council on March 26th. <laughs> um, and um, we will bring that, as we typically do. You know, uh, there's a lot of work to put that together, and we usually get to get it done right before the due date on April 1st. Um, but we also traditionally bring that to the Planning Commission as an informational item. So we'll have an opportunity to review it. Um, you can check it out at the city council level, but that also gives you an opportunity to ask questions and provide any feedback as well. So that'll likely be um, in um, April when we bring that to the commission. Um, but yeah, before we jump, to, oh, go ahead. And once more, I'm not being cute, but this is a big accomplishment. Can we do a mayor resolution or something your staff would like? Like, is there some sort of something Thanks we could so do much. for everybody? If it was me, I'd yeah, do like a, a float in the parade, you know, but <laughs> I realize Ryan might not want to be on there, but <laughs> please consider something serious as a thank you to everyone who worked on that. Thank announcement. you. I, yeah. I appreciate that. Um, you know, we're often uh, heads down, charging ahead. That was great work. And, and you are right. That is a, a really huge accomplishment. You know, last year, was, was quite the year for us with um, both the meeting the arena targets, getting our housing element certified on time. Um, the only one in our tri-county region, Santa Cruz, Monterey, and San Benito counties to do so. In fact, when I checked um, recently, it was just a few weeks ago that um, Salinas was the second city in the region to get um, their housing element certified. And Salinas is doing a lot of great work. Mm -hmm. They're a pro-housing uh, pro uh, city. Um, and um, they actually were one of the four cities that scored higher than us on the pro-housing <laughs> designation. Um, they, yeah, they're doing a lot of really good work. The new um, overpass and all that sprawl, come on. <laughs> yes, um, yeah. So... Um, you know, between uh, the pro housing designation, meeting the arena targets, and getting our housing element certified on time, you know, there was a lot of really great work um, and, and big accomplishments last year. Um, so, um, the last thing that I'll give you a heads up well, two more things. Uh, the last thing for March 26th is we are anticipating the Santa Cruz Hotel, excuse me, the Cruz Hotel, northeast corner of um, Front and um, 
Laurel, um, that you heard um, 15th? 2.15. Yeah, 2.15. Um, and it'll be going on March 26th. Um, we were anticipating um, having the food bin um, development go on that uh, same date, but um, we're uh, now anticipating that's going to that's going to be an April hearing for food bin. So um, stay tuned for that. And then your upcoming schedule. Um, we do have that informational item the next, uh, which we should be able to provide on um, April fourth. Um, in conjunction with one other item, which is just a, um, a consent calendar item. So um, it'll be a light meeting for a change. Um, so there's no meeting on the 21st? Uh, we do not have anything scheduled for the 21st. Okay. Correct. Um, and so that uh, the um, there's a gym at 901 SoCal um, okay. that uh, we have uh, anticipated for April 4th. And then um, if our staff members are present, I will not be available that day. But if others are present, we will also put the um, housing element annual update informational item. On the 4th. On the 4th, yes. I'm out that week on spring break, just so you know. Thank you for that. Carry on. Thanks for that heads up, yes. <laughs> um, Shortly following that, the date is not uh, set yet, but um, the outdoor dining on private property, the standards related to that will be coming to the commission currently anticipated on um, 418. Um, and that is still tentative at this point. We're, we're doing some outreach next week and you know, we'll see what kind of feedback we have. If we can turn that around for the 18th of April, then um, that's what you would be hearing then. And that concludes the update. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and we have no subcommittee or advisory oral reports tonight. And we also have no items referred to future agendas. So with that, I'll adjourn this meeting. Thank you all. Good job. Ooh, that was good.